Ladies and gentlemen, how in the hell are you? Hope you're having an amazing Monday. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile lets you safely order from home and maximize your savings with plans that start at just $15 per month. Now, I personally have been using Mint Mobile. They had a pretty killer deal going on over the holidays, but I've been using it before that. And let me just tell you, it absolutely augured my uh, cell phone bill in a good way, meaning it took it, I think, more than half of what I was paying before. Now, if that sounds interesting to you, you can explore it on your own by going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail. Mint Mobile is passing those savings directly on to you. All of the plans that you're going to find come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data or data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan, and you can keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. A little side note on that. If you're going to do that, make sure you have the login information for your previous provider. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. MintMobile.com slash cleared hot. That is MintMobile.com slash cleared hot. You can cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at MintMobile.com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. If you have a dong salon, you need to have this as your primary tool. Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their lawnmower 3.0 has proprietary advanced skin safe technology. So, this trimmer reduces cuts on your nuts. It's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower if that's your thing. The lawnmower 3.0 comes inside their brand new Perfect Package 3.0, which makes for the perfect gift. It's literally everything you need to keep trimmed, cut free, and smelling nice. If you're using the same trimmer that you use on your face, on your balls, well, you're gross and nasty, and you shouldn't do that. The Perfect Package 3.0 also includes the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, because who doesn't want that? You already put deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting it on your sack? Speaking of sweaty and stinky balls, there is the Crop Reviver. This product, along with the Crop Preserver, keeps your balls from sweating, smelling, and sticking. All of these products smell good. Their manly scent is attractive, and it will help you set the mood, if you know what I mean. The Perfect Package will also come with a pair of Manscaped boxers that will keep your junk feeling fresh all day. It is time to upgrade those tired old boxers that you have been using to some high-performance anti-chafing boxers. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code CLEAREDHOT at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Again, 20% off and free shipping with the code CLEAREDHOT at manscaped.com. That is 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code CLEAREDHOT. This episode is also brought to you by Magic Spoon, my single favorite snack and the addition to my diet that has truly saved me. I have been trying to cut down on carbs and sugar and unhealthy food, but I still like to snack and I like sweet things. I've tried drinking protein shakes and powder for years, but I have finally found a delicious way to get my protein other than in the liquid form, and I can do it before or after workouts. I know we're all trying to eat better, but a healthier breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has some amazing flavors that you're going to love, but without all the bad stuff in it. They've just released a brand new variety pack, and it's now featuring peanut butter. The peanut butter flavor has gotten so much love that they've actually decided to keep it permanent and add it to the best seller's variety pack, which also includes frosty, fruity, and cocoa. All I'm going to say is try a cocoa peanut butter combination. You're welcome. If you do that, it's still zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of, uh, grams of carbs in each serving. 140 calories a serving, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. If this sounds delicious to you, which I hope that it does, go to magicspoon.com slash cleared hot to grab a variety pack and you can try it today. And be sure to use the promo code cleared hot, all one word, all uppercase, at checkout to save $5 off your order. They're so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal is waiting for you at magicspoon.com slash cleared hot. Using the promo code cleared hot to save $5 off. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Feels. Do you experience stress? 
or about some anxiety, chronic pain perhaps, or maybe you have trouble sleeping at least once a week. You are not alone because I have those same issues. Feels. What is it? It's a premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. And what does it do? Well, it naturally helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. It could not be easier to take. This is a sublingual CBD, meaning it goes underneath your tongue. You place a few drops of feels under your tongue, and you're going to feel the difference within minutes. The thing to remember about CBD is that finding your right dose is important. So this is why I recommend going to their website and perhaps selecting the flight because it is a different dosage variety and you can find what works for you. If you're new to CBD, don't be worried. Feels offers a free CBD hotline and text message support to help guide you through your personal experience. It works naturally to help you feel better. There's no high hangover or addiction. Feels definitely has me feeling the best every day, and I think it could probably help you as well. You can join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel it at any time. Again, Feels has me feeling the best I've ever felt every day, and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash cleared hot, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That is F-E-A-L-S dot com slash cleared hot. To become a member and get 50% off automatically, take off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash cleared hot. And that is all I have on the business side of the house. My guest today is an amazing human being. His name is Kyle Carpenter. He, I was going to say was a Marine, but we discussed this on the podcast. Once a Marine, always a Marine. He is a Medal of Honor recipient for his actions in Afghanistan. His story of survival, his attitude and how positive he is blew me away. It actually truly recharged and refreshed my batteries. I am so incredibly humbled and honored he was willing to make the trip out to Montana. Can't believe we got to sit down and talk for about three hours, and I am not going to say anything else because he does a better job of describing who he is and what he went through than I ever could. So, Episode number 167 with Kyle Carpenter. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a man, they give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Mr. Carpenter, are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you for making the trip out here. Of course, man, I'm By honored. By the way. Did I? How did we get? How did how did we link up? I forget how this happened because I just got fired up that it was going to happen. I think I reached out to you though. Uh, you did, you did. Was uh, it on? But Instagram? I got fired up as well. Uh, <laughs> it was on Instagram, yes. and thankfully, uh, Ben worked on the incredible Alive Day video that he did, and uh, I think it was shortly after that. So maybe you saw that, but I I've known who you uh, are were are. For a long time, I don't know why I hadn't uh, hadn't reached out before. I, f- I forget. I was having a conversation. I think I was having a conversation with somebody about how few living Medal of Honor recipients that there are, and uh, he was like, "You know, Dakota Meyer." I'm like, "Yeah, but there's another one." And I actually I was started to look it up. And that short guy, yeah, but- <laughs> the short guy. It's well, Dakota's pretty short too. So actually, he's okay. He's about five. Well, I'm six foot, so he's five eleven at most. I refuse to give him an inch on me. No, but we were having a conversation, and then I realized, like, why would I not reach out and try to have a conversation with you? It's uh, it's a rare thing, as you know. Um, you know, I can only imagine it's had a substantial impact on your life, which I'm sure we'll get into. But it's uh, it's an honor to have you here, man. I really appreciate you making the travel to come up. Absolutely, absolutely, and I uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I know you said that, you know, talking before the show began that. Just a seal and this and that, but it is an honor to sit across the table from you. And uh, like I told you when, I won't say I quite fangirl, but like I told you <laughs> when you uh, when you reached out and messaged me, uh, I'm a big fan and supporter of, of your take on life, how you live life, and how you make the most of it, which is really at the foundation of everything what I'm trying to do. Yeah. it's You know, it's interesting having people say those things or to hear somebody say that about me because when I look in the mirror you know I have good days and bad just like everybody else yesterday not an awesome day just uh 
you know, scholastic issues with my son. I'm sure you remember being 17 years old and perhaps not feeling like the rules applied to you. And sometimes, you know, parents get called for that. So that was largely my day yesterday. But I mean, I look in the mirror and I'm as flawed as the next person. You know, I have ups and downs, um, plenty of things that I wish I had done better, plenty of things that I wish I could change. I just try to be honest about it, you know, and I do feel a burden of my old job to a degree because I was just having a conversation with somebody about this a few days ago. It, it's inescapable. I cannot get a, away from the fact that I used to be a SEAL. Yes. And people will view me through that lens. And I see it as a burden to to some degree. I try not to keep it in the forefront of my mind, but I see it as a burden to live up to that because I, I am in awe of the people that I serve with. Like we were saying before we started, I, I know people that I serve with that I don't even feel comfortable saying that I had the same occupation. So I'm like, so you did all that? I'm like, okay. Um, Technically, on paper, we have the same job, but I don't, you know, I don't rate even comparing myself to that person. It's an, it's an odd place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in different ways, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, and I, I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but the reason I'm doing a lot of the things I am doing now is because... Uh, It's like every interview, every question, every conversation, the majority of them revolve around the Medal of Honor and those five seconds on the roof and the grenade and, you know, how I felt after and all these things. But, uh, you know, I'm Kyle. And, yes, I'm a Marine and a Medal of Honor recipient, but uh, and, and a, a big part of why I wrote my book is I'm so much more than that. So I absolutely understand where you're coming from, and it's a, uh, it's um, kind of a beautiful burden to not be able to escape. That's how I would describe it too, and I hope people understand that when I say that. I'm not saying it in a negative manner. It is a beautiful thing. Um, I've talked with other Medal of Honor recipients, and they, you know, for one, it absolutely has an impact on their life, and two, it is a burden. They've all described it like that, but something that they want to carry on in the best light. Possible. I mean, I can't. I can't imagine that it wasn't incredibly life changing. Probably not what you were uh, gunning for. It's like <laughs> I, I got. We both have a purple heart. I got one, and people would be like, "Congratulations!" I'm like, Ugh. "Yeah." We need to talk about yeah. <laughs> the old enemy marksmanship <laughs> award that I got. <laughs> yeah. Or awesome. Congratulations. You're a Medal of Honor winner. Like, nah, I didn't really. You weren't, you weren't going for that. Yeah. That's not why you joined. That's not what you're looking yeah. for. That was the end result of, uh, for me, I had no say in it whatsoever. I just was on the wrong end of a rifle, but yeah, it's, <clears throat> I've had a lot of people say, you know, congratulations on your purple heart. I'm like, stop for a sec. We're going to chat. <laughs> yeah. A little educational moment. Yeah. Well, I explain to them how I feel about it. And I literally describe it in the terms of being the enemy marksmanship award. That is only how I feel about it. People. I'm not saying that everybody does. So yeah, I'm a fan of making fun of myself. It allows me to get through life a little bit easier. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> Do you enjoy doing the interviews and talking about that moment in your life that was obviously very uh, pivotal? I do. I enjoy educating people on not just that moment, but beyond that, um, what it means to be a Marine, what it means to serve, and all of the things that uh, kind of are incorporated into that. But um, uh, I try to, and over the years I've kind of adapted and learned and evolved like I'm, I hope we all do, but through the interviews, you know, I've learned to, uh, whenever we're just maybe sticking on that moment or that day, um, you know, try to throw something else in there to re not completely redirect the conversation, but um, to add things that, you know, I'm just as proud of. Uh, beyond the Medal of Honor, you know, graduating from school, running a marathon, all of these things that I've done since. Um, so, uh, you know, it does get tiring, um, but, you know, I'm always honored to do it. It, yeah. it, it uh, even though 
uh, even good things can wear on you. Yeah, like you said, a beautiful burden. Yeah, exactly. What led you to the Marine Corps in the first place? Just so you know, I consider you folks to be a special breed. I was doing jujitsu with one, well, because once a Marine, always a Marine. I think we can agree that that is how most Marines feel about it. Um, he, he likes to come in with a camo duffel bag. I like to make fun of him for it. I thank him for his service every time I see him. I'm like, hey, dude, what's up? Thanks for your service. He hates you. No, his response <laughs> is, fuck you, man. And then he starts <laughs> laughing. Uh, but, it's, but like, you know, it. Marines are, of all the branches of the, of the military, you know, I love the, you're a rifleman first. You're, you are in a profession of arms, period. We exist to kick ass. I mean, these are my terms, not the Marine Corps doctrine, but. <laughs> Un- unofficially. Yeah, unofficially. unofficially. In, Andy's, in Andy's doctrine, this is what it is. But I've always appreciated the headspace and I've always appreciated how it, for most, it's a lifelong passion and connection. I don't hear or see in the SEAL community. I would say it's closer to that, but man, the SEAL community is so small in comparison to the Navy in general. Right. I don't see, uh, and I don't see this. Say this negatively. People from you know carrier or submariners, they just don't have that connection once they get out. It seems. Whereas Marines, you know who the Marines are. You always know who the Marines are. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse, yeah. That's a true statement too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think this ties in with a question I get a lot, and that is, why did you do what you did? Um, even though I don't remember it, you know, why, obviously, did you cover a grenade for your fellow Marine? And uh, it's, uh, you know, throughout boot camp and my time in the Marine Corps, my short time before I was injured, uh, you know, they don't like in the movies, you know, throw grenades on the ground and see who will jump on it. Um, you know, the reason that I did what I did again, even though I don't remember and the, the pride that comes with being a Marine and, um, you know, not that really in, in the heat of the moment it comes down to the person, not that the Marine Corps is any more courageous than the next branch. You know, we all raise our right hand, as you know. Um, but, you know, the Marine Corps, from the moment you step on those yellow footprints at Paris Island or Recruit Depot San Diego, it is ingrained to you, into you that, first of all, no uh, recruit, no human being, no Marine, if you are you know, blessed or stupid enough to earn that title. Uh, <laughs> n- you know, n- we're all equal. And those that are wearing the uniform to the right and left of you, you know, your life is no more valuable than theirs. And, and you know, we're all in it together. But... Beyond that, you know, when we get uh, knocked down and out every single day, when you know we, we don't get sleep or we're hungry, whatever it is, in those moments, they sit us down and they tell us the courageous stories of Marines that have came before us. They tell us about those Marines that at 17, 18, 19 years old were told that you know, realistically, you're probably not even going to make it off of that beach. If you make it off the beach, if you're lucky enough to make it off the beach and be the small percentage, you're probably not going to survive the next five minutes. If you do, you know, essentially you are, uh, you have a better chance than not of, you know, not making it to see the, the victory at the end of this war. But when that landing craft you know, drop that door, open that door, they charge for it anyway. The Marines that covered grenades for their fellow Marines throughout history. And just all of these things that really, uh, it's almost at the end of the day, they don't have to, you know, train you to do these things. It just comes naturally with the um, immense amount of courage and sacrifice 
and and altruism that that uniform that you now wear represents. And so they it, they just from our history, you know, we just want to be courageous and we want to live up to the name that those Marines that came before us earned. The lineage and legacy and history of of courage in the Marine Corps is it's unbelievable. So I haven't been on a ton of Marine Corps bases, but a little bit in Camp Pendleton, north of where I was stationed in right. San Diego. Every building you go into, there's history on the walls. And I, was, I remember standing in front of those, I don't know if they'd call them plaques or, you know, it's a an homage to a person and what they did. But it, And if you look down the wall, though, it's, it's the history and legacy of that heroism in the Marine Corps. And I remember just slowly working my way down like multiple hallways just reading these stories of stuff that as somebody who volunteered to be in the military was blowing my mind like on every citation i was like what and then you go to the next one and you read it like what like who are these people like and it, it made me it made me question myself to be honest reading those like do i do i have the ability to do what these people did. Like, I think I do, but these dudes did it. You know what I mean? There's a difference right. between knowing the path and walking the path. <laughs> exactly. But that, that history, I don't doubt that is, it's a deep, deep connection to all the Marines. They, they did not do stuff like that in Navy boot camp. It was different, you know, but they were largely training people for shipboard life. Right. Um, and not that there's not heroic actions that occurred uh, on ships or naval, you know, Pearl Harbor, or naval engagements. Like there's some crazy stuff, but, you know, maybe the Navy would be better and maybe they've changed it now, but maybe they'd be better if they celebrated those histories and brought everybody together and explained the legacy of that uniform. Because Marines truly, they are a special breed. And I say that in the best way possible. Like uh, I was, we were changed today and I was talking to the guy. He's like, I told him I had a podcast coming up. He's like, who's it with? I was like, Cal Carpenter. And he'd stopped dead in his tracks. He's like, shut up. And he was like, can I come meet him? I'm like, no, he doesn't like you. He doesn't want to know you. <laughs> yeah, he was actually busy. Otherwise, I probably would have had him come by. But again, the immediate connection. He knew exactly who you were. He knew the situation. He knew the story because that knowledge is passed down. And I think that's a great thing. And it really ties it really ties the Marines that I've known um, closer probably, I think, than any other branch. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. But what led you to the Marines? Because you had to have enlisted after 9-11. Oh yeah, absolutely. Did uh, you come from a military family? N- no. Okay. Uh, my uh, my grandfather, my mom's dad was in the Navy. Yep. Uh, but he died when I was very young. So besides that, I have no one else in my family uh, that came before me and served. Um, I graduated high school in 2008. I went to a community college. Um, I wasn't extremely confident going to that school. Uh, I didn't know, you know, where that lack of confidence was coming from. I just always have felt like there was something more out there. When you say lack of confidence, do you mean in your scholastic ability or just as a person you didn't feel comfortable? Just as a person, I just, I didn't know if that's where I should be at that point in my life. And so, you know, fast forward a few weeks into that semester And um, obviously, we were in a time of uh, two conflicts. There was a lot of people out there giving a lot. Um, And, you know, just sitting around, uh, seeing myself, seeing those around me, uh, whether it was um, just only caring about small, um, not important things, you know, spending their parents' money, not, not caring to put the work into school, just, uh, that just added to, you know, kind of what am I doing? And so, uh, I had thought about the military and specifically the Marine Corps throughout high school. Um, I remember early on in life, I was on a, a church trip uh, early in middle school and wherever we were, you know, we got a couple hours of free time and uh, I went in this thrift store type shop and I found 
just the classic gray USMC black letters (laughs) t-shirt, which I thought was like the coolest thing ever. Uh, After my mom saw how cool I thought it was, I don't know where it went, but that shirt quickly disappeared. Uh, But throughout high school, you know, I loosely thought about the military and service and what that might mean, what it might take. Uh, So after that semester, I went home, I talked to my parents, and uh, I knew that I wasn't where I needed to be, and it it quickly became very clear that uh, I wanted to serve, I and more than that, I I needed to serve. And I had a very strong conviction, and so uh, I researched all the other branches. I went to see a couple of other recruiters, some who didn't even stand up and shake my hand when I came through the door. So that was kind of a quick, all right, I see where... Where, uh, I see where my value is here yeah, in the organization. Yeah. I know I'm just a number, but come on, at least lie to me, you know. And so, um, so, uh, but um, I had met and spent some time uh, through all of this with a, a former combat infantry marine, and um, just the way that he carried himself, uh, the type of leader he was in the workplace. And just all of these things, uh, that helped me narrow down that Marine Corps decision. But ultimately, you know, uh, playing sports growing up, uh, moving around, you know, I I felt like I had always been pushed or I had always pushed myself. And, you know, on the football field, obviously that doesn't translate completely to uh, being a, a, a combat Marine, but... Um, I wanted to join a branch and I wanted to do something that pushed me past a point that I knew about myself and I wanted something that would push me to um, a point of realizing who I really was, what I could really take and what I could really do. How did your parents respond to that conversation? It was extremely difficult. <laughs> it was extremely difficult. Um, How'd you drop it on them? Well, I talked to my dad first. And you hadn't signed up at this point, right? You were still in the ideation phase, or had you gone and no, no, John Hancock? I, I, I did, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't hit him. I didn't hit him that hard. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I talked to my dad, and um, he remembers the conversation word for word. I talked to my dad on the back porch. And then we went and talked to my mom. and Flanking maneuvers. Yeah. It's better to have overwhelming fire superiority with the mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, um, and so we talked to mom, and, you know, she'll tell you, and I'm going to be honest, she was completely devastated. I mean, for months, it was extremely hard. I could tell when she woke up in the morning that she had cried through the night, and just her... I mean, understandably so. Her oldest son, you know, one, not having any family history in the military. Yeah. Her oldest son joining in a time of two wars. And not only that, uh, he wants to join the Marine Corps. And uh, at this point, we hadn't gotten into the whole uh, infantry. I, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't giving him small doses because I told him I was going to join. But... Uh, I, I didn't want to hit him with any more at that time. It wasn't that they were small doses, but they were small. Yeah. And doses. Yeah, comparatively. <laughs> and Spoon feeding, if you will. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, uh, but, you know, it was hard for a while. But, uh, and, and we obviously talked multiple times throughout this. You know, are you sure you want to do it? Uh, do you want to go to a different school? Whatever it was, do you want to travel the world? Will that help kind of fulfill whatever it, this is that you need? Mm-hmm. But when I really sat him down and you know said, listen, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is how I, what I truly feel my path and my purpose is. You know, it might only be for the next four years. I might stay in 30 years. But for right now, I have to do this and whatever happens it's because I chose this and I wanted this and from that moment on not that they've never ever not been supportive in my life but it's kind of like you know after that that final definitive conversation 
uh, where I told them all of that, you know, they immediately, it was kind of like no looking back. They was just, okay, this is going to be tough, but we support you and we'll, we'll be there for you. And they've been there from the moment I was born to the moment I woke up in the hospital. How long after that conversation did you, did you go to San Diego or Paris Island? Paris Island. And uh, just a few months uh, at the time, probably because the Marine Corps needed numbers. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, um, yeah, I was only in the debt program or the delayed entry program for a few months. And uh, I went to boot camp in March of 2009. How was that experience? My experience with Marine Corps boot camp, let me tell you, is framed off of Full Metal Jacket. That's all I have. And I want to believe at the deepest portion of my soul, that's exactly like it was. <laughs> that's exactly how it was. <laughs> Gunny Army did a good job. But uh, no, I mean... Uh, how long is Marine Corps boot camp? 13 weeks. Okay, Navy side, I think it was eight. And again, there's differences, you know, di- yeah. a different end state. Um, I had almost nothing in common with the people I went to boot camp with because we I was on this path. They were on this path. I'd imagine Marine Corps boot camp was much more parallel trajectories of where you guys were going to head, guys and gals. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, as you said, all all Marines are riflemen first. And so our boot camp was, um, you know, our job that was going to come later down the road after boot camp had nothing to do with any part of that 13 weeks it was strictly uh let's rip the door off of this van when they pull up uh by the biggest human scariest human being i've ever seen stand on these yellow footprints and from that moment until graduation 12 weeks later because the last week you're there you're a marine and you're kind of um i mean you're, you're treated like a human pretty much. Yeah. And so, uh, but that, that 12 weeks up until that graduation is just, um, tear you down completely. And, and the first few hours you're there, uh, everyone, you know, gets your head shaved. Uh, you all instantly become recruits. You have to talk in third person. You can't refer to yourself as I, I me that. anything. I forgot about uh, that. I mean, you have to ask request. You have to re- this recruit request permission to make a head call. Sit down, shut up. You're an idiot. Uh, okay. And that's military talk for going to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let me ask like six more times and try not to like you know wet myself. But uh, no, it was just um, you know they they do that to again. Just like you you wear the uniform and to the right and left of you, you're all equal. They cut your hair. You know, no one's different than anyone else. You're all recruits. And they tear you down. And they begin that teardown process. And everyone breaks. Uh, just a matter of when, whether it's the first day or 11 weeks into it. Some people break over, just like in combat, you know, some people break over the craziest stuff. And, you know, like me, my, my breaking point was the simplest little foot movement in a drill. But I had just been uh, so, I don't, I don't want to say tough. I don't think that's a word. But I had been so <laughs> tough and so driven and so focused up until that point that it, it wasn't that it was hard. It was just uh, probably just in the moment how tired I was, whatever, just frustrated Um, But also, you know, I was a squad leader and there's three squad leaders per platoon. And um, it's it's an amazing, you know, especially looking back at uh, hindsight, you see so much more. But, uh, you know, looking back, if one of the 20 guys in my squad messed up and got destroyed, you had to get destroyed with them. And, uh, you know obviously tough lessons at the time and with that drill movement it wasn't just like okay i have to do it again the whole platoon has to do it again over and over until my dumb ass gets this little foot movement right uh but now it's like you know that that taught me forever that and now whether i'm speaking to a fortune 500 company or marine recruits 
you know, that taught me and that showed me that you should never uh, expect or demand or, or uh, you know, make anyone around you that you are a leader to go through something that you haven't already been through yourself or that you wouldn't be willing to, to go through with them. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's kind of like leadership 101, but, uh, you know, with the, I don't, you know, with the type of world we're living in now, it's, it's, uh, it obviously doesn't hurt to get back to the basics and just, you know, don't expect something from someone if, if you're not willing to, to put the work in and, and grind as well. Yeah, people ask me a lot about <clears throat> boot camps, and the best way I can describe it is very similar to what you did. It's the breaking down so you can build up. Because from my perspective, at least, <clears throat> we live in a very me-centric world. Look right. at me. Look at the, you know. And then the military, that transitional phase from when you join until you hopefully leave refined and have a different headspace, it's that breaking of the sense of me being important and the sense of we becoming important. So it's very close in spelling, very different in meanings. Exactly. <laughs> but you have to you have to reduce the human being a little bit to get them to focus more around the people to their left and right. Uh, and it's a process and a crucible. And I think the Marine Corps, like I said, it does an amazing job at doing that. And it has long lasting impact for the rest of your life once you can understand that value of before I do something, even in a moment, I'm going to look left and right and actually make sure that the people next to me are better off than I am. Exactly. And then I'm going to move. Yep. It takes time. Yep. And, and another thing, I, I, I don't know why I'm just remembering this, uh, but in the Marine Corps, uh, the leaders eat last. And I, I, that might be kind of a saying or the same thing throughout the rest of the military, but I don't think so. I like that concept, though. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, you have a sergeant major, and you have a three week out of boot camp private. You know, that sergeant major is going to make sure that that private goes first, and that all the Marines in front of him or under him are taken care of, are fed, and doing okay before he grabs that that plate for food which might seem uh small or like a not important lesson to people but that daily reinforcement it's massive absolutely and it and then it plays itself out on the battlefield as well it does <laughs> yep for sure so yeah you made it through boot camp where did your journey take you after that oh to tropical islands and and, <laughs> and beautiful resorts uh -huh. My journey uh, took me to my, so after boot camp, you go to your uh, job school, which I was uh, 0311, um, and that means that I was infantry, and therefore I went to School of Infantry, which was just right down the road um, from where I was uh, two and a half months later, once I got done with SOI, going to be stationed for my next four years at Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Damn, man, you didn't get to travel much at all. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, it sounds like you got to travel on the base from building to building to building. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and so got done with boot camp, went to School of Infantry for two and a half months uh, where they um, really just take you out into the woods, make you dig a hole in the ground, a foxhole, a fighting hole, um, and you sit. And you, uh, you know, whether you're learning range cards, whether you're actively running ranges or just sitting there being cold, wet, hungry and miserable, uh, all of these things at the time, you're like, why are we doing this? A um, couple things still might not make sense. But overall, <laughs> uh, you know, whether you're just sitting there miserable or you're being kinetic and learning things, all of that I see now you know, played into, uh, and you know, most of your actual serious real training comes in the real Marine Corps. Once you get done with all your schooling, uh, and just like in, you know, the corporate world, like you learn most of not in college, but when you're actually doing the job. Um, but all of those things throughout that two and a half months of SOI helped prepare me like all Marines for the real Marine Corps. And, um, uh, 
when I got dropped to my unit, uh, mid September of 2009, um, when you graduate SOI, they send uh, some Marines that are, uh, you don't know what unit you're going to. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this SOI graduating class, and these buses pull up. And I mean, this is a couple hours after graduation. These buses pull up, and again, the scariest people that I've ever seen in my life. I think they were just like, oh, you've been to Iraq four times? Oh, you have tattoos from head to toe? Oh, <laughs> you hate anyone that hasn't been in at least six years? Like, you go pick these guys up. So you graduate SOI, and I remember, and I talk about this in my book, but I remember this guy steps off the bus, and he didn't have a skivvy shirt on, which I didn't even know, you know, was allowed. I thought you had to wear a skivvy shirt under, under your camis. And so didn't have a skivvy shirt on. He had this like crazy tattoo, a skeleton with like a shotgun. And, you know, I was just thinking, you know, here I am at, at the end of the barrel of this shotgun. Like, what have I done? <laughs> and so, and so uh, of course, they very nicely and politely tell us to get on the bus. And uh, they drive us a few miles down the road to Kent Lejeune. I got dropped to 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines. And the other half of our SOI, graduating SOI class uh, went to 3-6. And my unit and 3-6 uh, just happened to be two of the first units that did the push into Marja. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that was a very eye-opening real experience. A couple weeks after, um, you know, we, we were in our units uh, starting to train, things like that. Um, I got word that my uh, buddy Courier, he had, you know, graduated SOI, got dropped to his unit. The next day, he got a couple of the last days of his unit's pre-deployment leave, got to go home for a few days, came back a few, you know, a few months from boot camp pretty much, and he was the first KIA that 3-6 took days into the country oh man and so just like wake up call after wake up call yeah and not regretting it just like you know it's real now the realization exactly <clears throat> yeah i know exactly what you're talking about yeah and so um how did he die a sniper round through the neck i believe um but uh you know so it, it got real got to my unit we started training and shortly thereafter, uh, roughly a month or so, we got tasked with our first deployment, which was being on a, a Navy ship, the USS Wasp, which, dude, I hope that thing is sank to the bottom of the ocean now. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it, it was definitely the oldest <laughs> ship in the fleet. And uh, Do you remember what type it was? Probably like an LHA or something along those lines, a flight deck on top? Flight deck, but, but very a smaller small. One. Yes. For like Harriers and stuff like that. Or uh, vertical, or probably V twenty twos at that point. No, I think it had uh, just like four or five um, uh, fifty three super stallions. Okay, I think those are maybe LHAs. LHD. It may be. Okay, if okay. you put a million bucks on this table, I couldn't tell you the difference between those two. No, but I know they both exist. Absolutely not. You got they got numbers and letters <laughs> and stuff, and so. Uh, so it sounds like you were part of a mu. A marine expeditionary expeditionary unit or something along those lines kind of but it was like it was very small okay i mean it was just us our unit and the sailors that were taking us around so we went down and this is october time frame and the de deployment in october up, of 09 uh yes okay of 09 uh we went down to guantanamo bay cuba and we some of us got off the ship uh, some of us stayed on and did uh, um, Coast Guard and DEA supporting uh, Hilo missions off the ship. And then a few of uh, uh, guys from our unit got off in Dominican Republic and helped uh, train their troops on um, um, hmm. getting on and getting off helicopters uh, and just like basic stuff. So I still don't really understand what that deployment was about. We were just kind of all over the place doing whatever. It, it sounds super scatterbrained. Yeah, yeah. But uh, either way, we got off uh, Guantanamo Bay, and we had 
uh, a hard month and a half, almost two months of training on Gitmo. And um, I'm very thankful for that because it kind of helped expedite the uh, cohesiveness of our unit. Obviously, we spent a lot of time together. We got to know some of the older guys. And it definitely didn't didn't give us um, bragging rights or a combat uh, deployment or anything like that as far as uh, getting us on an equal playing field. Because the unit that I got dropped to, 2-9, the day that I got dropped to them, they had got back from Iraq in the past week and a half. And so, you know, it was not just the new guys but the new guys that didn't even go on that deployment yeah so at least gave us some time to get to know them us to train together and i'm very thankful for it because it was very difficult training um i would have never really known if i hadn't gone there but not only is it extremely hot but very rugged very mountainous and so in gitmo yeah in gitmo interesting and so now looking back uh even though we didn't know it at the time that was a great first really training deployment that helped kickstart our workup to get ready for afghanistan because we got picked up uh by, by the navy on gitmo got on the ship and as we we're cruising back to the to the states we were trying to make it back in time for christmas mm -hmm. as we we're cruising back you know we get word that president obama is about to make this huge announcement uh essentially he's going to give the thumbs up or thumbs down on the troop surge into afghanistan yeah and we knew that if he gave the thumbs up we were going to be one of the first units uh to to be inserted and so you know standing around in the depths of this navy ship uh and that's another thing being a new guy <laughs> and being assigned a bunk about seven decks down with no supervision the pits of hell you, pretty much yeah <laughs> yeah it's either hey y'all go fight each other and we just want to watch or you know uh on navy ships for anyone that hasn't been on one the the beds or the racks are maybe 15 inches you know space i mean bigger the only one i've seen with less space is on subs yeah bigger guys can't even turn over to, yeah. to sleep on the other side in the bed and so you know uh guys coming by waking you up just like punching you and you're just <laughs> trapped in this bunk like you can't go anywhere and so uh, you're fighting each other you're trapped in your bunk you're having to drag hunt i mean a hundred pound laundry bag i don't even i've never seen anything like that but a hundred pound laundry bag up these little you know stairs to the to the second deck where the laundry room is so uh, that was an experience but we were all down there huddled around this tv with broken connection and um president obama said that he was uh you know initiating the troop surge and it was a mix of you know being surrounded by cheers and kind of you know we're we're gonna get to do what we joined you know to give back to to uh you know, not only help people in Afghanistan and around the world, uh, but also, you know, uh, be Marines. Yeah. And so, uh, but I, I remember thinking, you know, that was just another, just another surreal moment of, okay, I can't really comprehend this, but another step towards it getting serious. So to go, not to interrupt you, but I want to no, go yeah. backwards because I'm curious. The guys from your unit who had just gotten back from that Iraq deployment, mm -hmm. how was that deployment for them? Did they was that a largely kinetic deployment? It was largely uh, let's hold the stability. And I ask that because it can frame. I mean, if you come off a ball kicker deployment, yeah, you're not really looking forward to that next. Hey, guess what? We're surging to a new country. So, right. I'm curious where their headspace was coming off of that, because some people will get into that space where it's, you know, kind of hold and maintain and they're not satisfied because they didn't get to be the Marine that they, or soldier, sail, seal, whatever it is that they wanted to be. So I was just curious about the headspace that they were going into that information with. Yeah, it was definitely a healthy mix of excitement, which was, you know, probably from more of the new guy crowd, 
mixed with, um, you know, now uh, I can only imagine how they were feeling, even though it wasn't extremely kinetic, you know, just to, as you know, uh, just to give your give your loved ones a hug for potentially the last time. Yeah. To sit on that bus on the way to the airfield and think, you know, who around me right now isn't going to be on this bus coming home. Or is it me? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, um, and so, you know, I can only imagine what they felt, but regardless, you know, it was coming. And so we got back, uh, on Christmas Eve of 2009, I believe, and, uh, went home for a few days, maybe a week. We came back and immediately started that workup, intense training for seven months. And then we left for Afghanistan in July of 2010. And did you know where you were going to be going in Afghanistan? It was pretty laid out? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. good. Because that, I mean, you can target your training towards that. Yeah, not the specific patrol base or, or cop, but uh, we definitely knew that we were headed to Marja. Okay, which yeah. is, yeah, considered gnarly. Yeah. <laughs> and before we even left, uh, another kind of surreal type moment was, uh, so we moved into Three Sixes barracks while they were gone and three six my buddy courier who got killed you know our soi class went to either two nine three six so when they left we moved into their barracks and uh not uncommon you know like marines do that all the time through deployments but uh you know knowing that we started to see just in the first few weeks guys coming back on crutches you know banged up walking around the barracks and I, I, uh, I'll never forget, it was me and my roommate. And I would have never asked this guy this, but my roommate, you know, he didn't really have a, a social cue meter. Of, Filter, if Hey, let's, let's probably not ask this guy that <laughs> probably almost just got killed. Hey, dude, what happened over there? Like, I don't know. Take a wild guess, man. Don't, don't put him on the spot like this. But he threw it out there anyway, and the guy goes, I got blown off the roof. Uh, blown off of a roof. I'm like, you know, how do you, where do you even start to process that? Like, this guy is super banged up because he got blown off of a roof. And that's where we were going. So, uh, yeah, we, it was roughly 10 day journey from North Carolina to the small uh, patrol base where we were going to be living and operating. Yeah. And, uh, but we, we got there and, um, probably the most real moment of all besides seeing that first casualty was, uh, you know, we're flying low and fast in these 53s, me and, and, uh, my squads packed in the back, the crew chief, cause I, I'm sure they, they give y'all ammo before this point. But not until that final leg uh, helicopter ride to your actual outpost out in the middle of nowhere do they start distributing ammo. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've, I've, I don't go anywhere unarmed, fully gunned up. Yeah, like, I've <laughs> never understood that. Trust me, I've never understood Holy that. Holy cow. But they're, uh, you know, they're handing out, uh, I was a saw gunner, and so he's handing me belts of ammo and uh, he says, of course, because it's so loud in there, he's like, we're going to take contact when we land. I'm sitting here. What if you had taken contact before you landed and you guys needed to unass that helicopter quickly? Like, Is, is there just like a para bag full of ammo that he's reaching into? Well, we would have either... Uh... We had either been a, a fiery helicopter <laughs> crash ball on the ground or getting overrun by enemy with no ammo i mean holy cow i was not aware that that was the sop yeah yeah uh whew, i was not in a leadership role that made that decision <laughs> okay not the one i would have made but yeah I, wow okay and so uh you know not that uh i was expecting it to just be you know sunshine and rainbows when we got there but i was like come on man Come on, Taliban, give us like 15 minutes to land and let me comfortably run inside before you start shooting at me. But uh, so that's how it started off. And every single day 
of that entire deployment from sunup to sundown was uh, just a, a really a vicious and just nonstop fight for survival. What were you guys tasked with doing? So since we were one of the first units uh, in there, it was um, first just hold your ground. Yeah. Uh, over the seven month deployment, uh, we're going to slowly keep working our perimeter out, pushing the bad guys out. And really we were just uh, laying the foundation for hopefully when future units came along to either relieve us or down the road uh, that they would have that stable region to start to capitalize on that and build schools, dig wells, build build yeah, roads. The rebuilding process. Yeah, because there wasn't even, uh, we had to get heloed out to our patrol base and any supplies, anything we needed throughout the entire deployment had to get brought in by helicopter because uh, the roads there was no infrastructure. We couldn't take our heavy vehicles on the roads because they would, as you know, just vaporize. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, these canal walls, these, these, uh, dirt paths, not even roads sometimes that you're driving on can very easily cave, give out. And now you're stuck with four or five Marines in a, you know, up armored vehicle upside down in a 10 foot deep canal and so uh you know fortunately after we lost marines to drowning and things like that you know we just uh we just you know we got we got our feet we got our boots we got our weapons and uh yeah. we got each other and that was pretty much it and it you know in afghanistan in that time period it might have been safer to be on foot anyway oh yeah i mean the ied threat i was there from january through august of 10 in uh, the Nabahar province. And we, it was like, I'm not going anywhere near a road. We were right. side by sides most of the time, no armor at all, but the ability to go places where people wouldn't think that you'd be traveling. So exactly. less likely to get IED. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if it's, uh, if it's difficult enough to where Marines don't want to walk through it, you know, granted we have all this weight and ammo and all these things, but if it's, you know, people are lazy. And if Correct. Marines don't want to walk through it, especially <laughs> with leadership encouragement, uh, they're probably not, you know, the enemy's probably not going to go there and take time to put IDs there. Yeah. it. We had uh, RGs sitting at the small fire base or FOB that I was at, and they just sat there at the gates. Everything else was side by side or foot travel. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, there was a gamble to that. Uh, the deployment, uh, let's see, the team that rotated in after us, one of the side by sides did encounter an IED and you can imagine, I mean, basically nothing left because they're golf carts. Yeah. But pr safer, I would say, than being in one of those RGs. I mean, they were they were starting to bury a thousand pounds, 1500 pounds of homemade explosive and just flipping these armored multi-ton, multi-tens of tons armored vehicles into the air a hundred feet. I mean, that, I don't want to go I don't know how I want to go. I don't want to go that way. Right. Or flipped upside down, drowning in one. That would be the way that would be worse. I right. Think. Yeah. So. But I always wondered, um, not, and sorry, not to, to veer off, but, you know, these massive IEDs, do they bring all of those, like that explosive in at night with vehicles? I mean, how do they get all of that there? So I've watched on uh isr footage when i was at the talk in mogensen which was the main base that was we had two trident elements so two platoons split out and i spent about half of the deployment as the operations officer between the two and <clears throat> you would it would be one or two people and it would to answer your question shortly it would be over time and incrementally so one or two people, you know, especially on like route one, the paved route that went from the south to the north, right. the drainage culverts that would go underneath, you know, the piped culverts, mm -hmm. that would be one or two people coming up with stuff in their hands. They would disappear under there, come back, nothing in their hands. Okay. Later that night, one or two people, and then that'd be it for a day. And sometimes, you know, you'd have a, a mind sweeping uh, element that would go and, you know, they'd put like the mirror down there, the camera, and they'd see it. And they'd either blow it in place or grab the stuff out. And- you know, for every, 
I mean, just imagine for every one predator up there looking at that, how many more culverts there are along Route 1. So in my experience, what I saw is they would do it very, very incrementally. They would do it in small groups, and they would just keep coming and coming and coming and coming. Okay. Yeah, and then usually wire it out, you know, or like the remote control key fob stuff. But, yeah, I don't know if I've ever been more hair on the back of my neck up than riding around in vehicles in that country. I'd rather be walking side by side or preferably in a helicopter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you guys uh, landed in Marja where you were at the fire base, how long had it been had it been since Americans were there before or had they been there before? Besides 36 cuz they were the first unit in and then we okay. we relieved them. Uh but uh Before 36 was that it? Was that an unknown province pretty much or where you guys were? I at believe least? so. Cuz a lot of um And that's gnarly because that's a lot of time as and as you, we were moving around in Afghanistan, I mean, you know as well as I do you push pockets of people into certain areas. Right. So you guys landed in a hornet's nest, it sounds like. Yeah, and so um, I remember uh, as we were going into country, you know, you get to different bases and you get closer and they start giving you more privileged information on your AO, exactly where you're going and things like that. And uh, one of the things that they talked about was uh, one of the challenges is uh, letting, showing that you care, but just letting, building trust, letting the people know that you're not going to be like the Soviets and just fly planes over and throw landmines out. Or you're not going to give the kids presents and then blow them up when they take them back home. So, uh, you know, to them it was kind of like, okay, you know, white person back then, white person now. Yeah. Uh, what What's the difference? But uh, when we really showed them that we were there, that we truly cared, you know, that we will take a knee in front of you to take the round instead of, you know, your family – uh, obviously it's, it's slow progress, but yeah. I do truly feel like, um, you know, we, we did break those barriers at least to some extent. And I do feel like we, um, you know, laid a, a, a good foundation, you know, whether, however it is now, I can only hope it's, it's still okay. But I do feel like, um, we at least showed them that, uh, we were, there for them and that uh we weren't there um to do anything but just try to help them get better do you remember uh ever having any circumstances where the local populace would warn you guys or try to try to help you yeah and i ask because that's an indication of that trust yeah you guys have exactly dis- establishing that relationship exactly exactly and so um, um, for me, it was subtle. We would, you know, it, the villages were around where we were. It just, you know, it'd be somebody maybe approaching the interpreter, like, don't go down that road. Exactly. Which is a death sentence for that person if they're found out. Absolutely. So it's a huge risk on their part. And they're only going to do that if you're doing exactly what you're talking about, trying to be there for the betterment of them, not the United States. That is a great point. Or locals coming by and sharing what food they have with you. Uh, and you're right, small gestures like that. Uh, but the best and, and arguably most heartbreaking example uh, of this is uh, about two weeks after I was injured. Now, we hadn't, and because of Afghanistan, the terrain, you know, instead of house to house and street to street, you're fighting more tree line to tree line across agricultural fields. Those across, fields are hard to describe too. Oh, the linear nature of it oh, yep. and everything that goes around it. How yep. you could just disappear on the edge of that. Yeah. It's a bastard. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> so with that said, we encountered very few times hand grenades throughout our deployment. But about two weeks after I was injured, a hand grenade and, and, uh, as you know, vast majority of the time they're fighting during the day. They don't have night vision capability. 
they're probably scared that we do and uh you know they're also weirdly just uh and i'm talking about the the quote-unquote bad guys here there are also people that work in their fields they have jobs they have families and so um and so uh, jihad is more fun in the daytime yeah Yeah. (laughs) right but a hand grenade came over uh into our patrol base over the wall one night and guess who's wreck it lands beside blows up all my fat snacks i wasn't even there anymore so one of the few (laughs) one of the few grenade attacks through the whole deployment it was like it was it was meant for me to get hit but i was already well off to the hospital uh thankfully um uh it landed by my rack and, and blew up by the tent but thankfully the squad my squad that slept in that area they were the ones tasked with night patrol that night oh so they weren't there they weren't there so that happened obviously whoever threw it was probably gone already back in bed sleeping uh, a couple nights later in the middle of the night a kid maybe 11 12 at the very most 13 uh, comes to our base and this is all told to me by my buddies that obviously thankfully didn't get hurt and we're still there um, but a kid comes to us in the middle of the night uh, he's crying uh, he, you know, asked my buddies not to hurt him, which no matter what he told us, we never would. Um, but it made a little more sense when he told us what was going on. And that was that a couple nights ago, the Taliban pulled him out of his bed. And this kid, uh, going back, sorry, to what we were saying, this kid had helped us. He told us where a daisy chain of five IEDs were. I mean, it would have wiped our whole yeah. squad off so, the map. And for people listening, daisy chain meaning they're all connected probably with debt cord. So if one goes, they're all going right. to go. So, so you wait for a squad that's dispersed in a line to get near this whole chain of IEDs, and then you blow it and obviously have mass casualties instead of one or two. So he told us where this daisy chain was, and, you know, of course we didn't tell anyone – they're kind of like drill instructors over there. It's like you don't really know how they find stuff out, but everyone somehow <laughs> talks. They have they have eyes in the back of their head. It's like, man, like how did they find out this kid told us this? But uh, so Taliban snatched him up in the middle of the night, pulled him out of bed, took him to the outside walls of our base, and uh, pulled the pin on a grenade, put it in his hand. Oh, shit. And, you know, uh, the decision was clear. You either throw this or you're going to hold on to it forever or let it go and and blow yourself up. And so, uh, you know, getting back to that example you asked about, um, uh, you know, people over there, uh, I think more than... uh, more people than not want that better life. They want change. They don't want to to live in fear. Um, and th- that example, along with many others, showed me that even though they didn't really express it, they couldn't express it. Uh, you know, when we walk out of our base and there would be the kids throughout the village that would salute us. You know, just little things that, that showed you, you know, these, these, these people, they might not know what's out there and they might not know how good they could have it, but, um, they, they do want to change at least just to not live in fear and to, you know, to just be able to have a life that isn't, um, dictated by someone else. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. How was the condition of that firebase you guys dropped into? I'm always curious because when we got to our firebase in Nabahar, we were living with our partner force, the ANA and the ANP. So we built it from the ground up. Yeah. And let me just tell you, we're not builders. <laughs> <laughs> there were some things that were not square, shall yeah. we say, if yeah. you were going to be using a level or a framing tool. <laughs> 
You did not have interior decorators, is what you're saying. No, we did. <laughs> but they just didn't know what they were doing. There was some very interesting carpentry that was taking place. We ran out of Hesco's, so it's like, well, I guess if you're looking at the base from this side, you can just see over the wall. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Put another guy up on post. I don't know. But yeah, it was... Uh, I would imagine it was austere. It was uh, primitive. Yeah. Yeah, it was primitive. Uh, we lived with... 15 maybe 12 to 15 afghan national army members uh they had a commander and it was just um myself and um our one platoon of marines wow how far away was the nearest american force uh i mean we had other patrol bases in the area uh within a a few miles radius which can be quite a distance depending on what's happening oh yeah but um Leatherneck was uh, roughly 30, 35 minute flight by helicopter. Okay. And that was the closest place with electricity. So you guys were out there. Oh yeah, we were out there. Yep. And, and, and on a day to day, like not a specifically, but on average, what would, what would your mission template look like? Get loaded out for bear and patrol to contact? Yep. Yep. Fuck. <laughs> Walk around until you get shot at and then try to... Um, get rid of uh the threat that is uh is attacking you and but again you know uh different different uh areas and different times require different missions you know that was not a stable area it was and and also it might help people uh, give a little context as to why this small small area small patch of farmland on the map was so bad you know when we uh not only have we been in afghanistan for years and years but uh when you know president obama gave that thumbs up and and we had the troop surge uh that disrupted the flow of money to the taliban that disrupted you know, the drug trade, the weapons trade, all of these things. And so Marja being such a uh, fertile uh, area to grow that poppy, you know, to grow everything that was helping uh, finance, um, essentially what was leading to Americans getting killed and the people in their own home country being treated terrible and killed. Uh, A lot of the Taliban throughout the southern part of the country and especially the uh, surrounding area, um, kind of like a, not a last ditch effort, but a, an effort to protect those cash crops flooded to the Marja area to, uh, to fight us. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. We surge more troops, so terrain or area that they used to hold or seize and hold easily yeah so they're getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed exactly yeah it absolutely makes sense exactly were you guys just surrounded by poppy fields oh yeah it's a crazy sight isn't yeah it? I, <laughs> I, so i didn't even know this yeah it's a crazy sight and i didn't even know this uh but uh my medevac bird picked me up in a marijuana field so i, I just had like plants you know all over me getting loaded onto the bird like <laughs> I guess if I, I was going to go out, I was going to go out right. But, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but yeah, no, you're just surrounded by uh, mostly poppy, but some marijuana too. And, you know, they use that to make hash. But um, yeah, poppy plants are very strange. Very strange bizarre looking. bizarre looking. Yeah. yeah, they are. Yeah. They are. Beautiful when they bloom, but bizarre very looking. Yep. Yeah. For the rest of their life cycle, it's kind of just like, huh. Yeah. Ugly looking plant. Yeah. yeah. So you guys, when did you guys drop into country? You said July? Uh, yes. Of uh, 10? Correct. And then you got injured November of 10. Correct. correct. Was there anything different about, uh, not that we're fast forwarding, but is it, was there anything different about the day that you got injured looking back in hindsight? Or was it, I, I look at my own injury, which was minor in comparison. I've, I've spent years second guessing myself did i do something wrong should i stayed where i was should i've stayed on the ladder instead of going into the courtyard and i I landed on and have come to peace with there's nothing i could have done i I just ended up you know i've seen people at vegas 
on incredible heaters, just number after number after number. But eventually, if they huck those dice enough, a seven will come up. Um, and maybe that's a shitty metaphor for what happened with me, but it, it really wasn't, one, it wasn't some high value target. It wasn't anything crazy that was going on. I just didn't see the dude who shot at me. Yeah. And I don't think I had done anything wrong. The guy just got the jump on me. Yeah. So that day he was better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, nothing different, uh, really, like geographically or mission wise, but where I was uh, is the contributing factor to what led to myself and many others in my uh, squad being injured. And that was roughly a day and a half before I got injured. Uh, my squad drew the short straw and uh, we, uh, we had a mission coming up and that was, hey, we need a squad to push south. And we had three villages to the south of our position. And we nicknamed them Shady, Shadier, and Shadiest because... I like it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was fitting because the further, I mean, every step you took... For sure. Further south... You're going into their territory, not Oh, yours. yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was, I mean, the entire deployment and every day was never a matter of, oh, I wonder if we're going to get shot at today. It was just a matter of when. Yeah. But uh, the thing about that was, you know, we were going into this not completely unknown like we we knew of it we had patrolled through it but you know we are going on this mission which uh the actual mission was pretty much go down to the border of shadier take over this compound which we had done recon and, and stuff on but take over this compound and kind of just stick with the mission that we had four months when we moved into patrol base beatley and that is you know, put your foot in the ground. And, uh, you know, we were doing this, looking ahead a few months later, there was going to be that next unit to come in and relieve us. So just like anything, I hope in life, you want to leave things better than when you found them. So uh, we went to establish a new patrol base and therefore hope, hopefully creating that stability in the region and uh, having all those good things to follow in the years later. Um, but we started getting shot at about halfway down. So <laughs> that, that was an awesome start. <laughs> and it, with this primitive mission, it was just, hey, we're going to get you relief in four or five days. Just pretty That's much. That's a long time to hold your ground, man. Yeah. It, uh, just try to survive until we can get you some relief. <sighs> and so... Uh, with that said, we had our packs on, which were stuffed Probably bursting. to the max. And so here we are. And, you know, I had probably, I never left. Every single day we went on patrol, I never left with less than 800 rounds. I usually had 800 in my pack and a 200-round drum, so 1,000 rounds. And sometimes I would walk back at the end of the day or end of the patrol and not have any i'm like oh man. every step like please don't shoot at us anymore you gotta save a little bit please though. don't shoot at us anymore <laughs> and so uh you know we're just loaded down and so here we are like slow moving turtles getting shot at i mean really all we could do was kind of take a knee maneuver a little bit but just hope we didn't get hit thankfully we did not we got down we took over the compound and uh, shortly after, uh, it's also important to note that uh, right before we stepped, they canceled our supply drop and pushed it to either that night or the next day. But that had our sea wire. That had pretty much everything that we were like, okay, we don't have to pack this because we're going to get it right when we get there. They were going to drop it at the compound you were going to take over. Correct. Okay. And so, uh, but shortly thereafter, we got down there and the first grenade attack came. And again, we hadn't, we weren't extremely familiar with hand grenades. So that's so, a like ballsy, incredibly close range attack slash oh yeah. tactic. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking whites the eyes type shit. Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, you know, they just started raining into the compound. And I, it was, uh, it just shows you how inexperienced we were with them because someone said, who's throwing rocks 
and then they started going off. So bam, right there out of the gate. And we only, we had one squad, roughly 11, 12 Marines and a Navy medic, a Navy corpsman. And, uh, we had maybe five ANA. And so bam, right off the bat, first grenade attack, two Marines were injured, one ANA. So there's three down. And over the next 24 hours, it was, again, just trying to hold that ground, but just the most hyper alert, you know, you can be. Were they just running at the walls and hucking them and then probably running off? <sighs> See, um, I, uh, I never want to speak ill about anyone, um, or any leaders if they have good intentions. But um, some of our leadership were um, uh, fresh officers. and uh, Junior in their experience. And sometimes things, just like in the real world, things look better on paper than they do uh, when, when, when uh, the real planning or... or you know, real, real, uh, situation begins. And so we all felt that the compound that we took over, there were better options, but you know, we're just, uh, dumb grunts. And so, you know, we did what we needed to, we took it over, but especially with those three that were already injured and we only had one squad, it was just, you know, we hadn't even had a chance to fill sandbags to build those. It was that fast. Oh yeah! Holy cow! I didn't even have the chance to build sandbags uh, for the for the uh, post positions, and um, we were closer. We were pretty much in the village. We were on the outskirts, but there were enough compounds within throwing distance, and you know, of course, they knocked the holes out so they could run through all the compounds yeah. without exposing themselves. And you guys can't see any of this cause it's below eye level. Right. Exactly. And not only that, like we didn't have a post to have the chance to hopefully see something. And so, you know, fast forward over the next 24 hours, attack after attack came. And, um, thankfully we didn't have any more casualties until myself and my fellow Marine and, and buddy got hit on the roof but that was November 21st when I was injured. Uh, our shift on post, which anyone listening, uh, we refer to essentially lookout positions as a post position. And Marines in training and combat, no matter what we're doing or where we are, there's always a Marine on post watching out uh, for not only that enemy activity, but um, doing that so the Marines inside the compound can eat, sleep, clean their weapons. And so uh, the only thing I remember from the entire day until I got hit later that afternoon was around 7.30 a.m. Someone was coming up. Uh, they initiated the first attack of the day. So our alarm clock was AK-47 fire. And I remember rolling over my sleeping bag and unzipping it and thinking something like, oh, here we go again, another day in Afghanistan. And that was it. Fast forward to that afternoon and myself and my buddy were sitting on post on top of this roof. And uh, we had made it through our whole four hour shift. I mean, we were minutes from getting relieved. And uh, it was just eerily quiet which if you're not getting shot at it's pretty much eerily quiet because you're just anticipating the yeah, next time you get shot at but there's there's little noises i know exactly what you're talking yeah about. there's a difference between it being quiet out and then it being eerily quiet right, right. like the bugs stop making noise yeah the birds shut up you don't see any people nothing yeah like for whatever reason the wind and it's middle down. of the day yeah, yeah. And that's when you need to be like reaching down to put your chin strap on yeah because <laughs> it's coming hi pro <laughs> yeah. yeah and so uh and so me and Nick, we're going, over, we're going through scenarios that could potentially happen. Okay, if they come down this alleyway or this road, this is how we're going to react. This is what we're going to do. And uh, not that you can really ever completely prepare for a situation like that. We were just trying to get any jump we could. 
And so, ironically, the last thing, at least that I remember us talking about, is I asked him, so what happens when a grenade comes up here on the roof? And he's like, my ass is off this roof. And I said, dude, I'm right behind you. <laughs> Obviously. Like, Did no, you I'm just going to hang up. sandbags up there? Like, talk to me about the position you were in. Oh, yeah. So that's another just lovely part of this story. So in our packs going down there, because we didn't get that supply drop, we just took as many empty sandbags as we could. We had sandbags, water, food, and ammo. That was it. Sounds about right. The essentials. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> So, um, uh, 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 the day before I was on post, so we had, uh, and anyone listening, the compounds over there are, it's just like a big square courtyard with no roof, completely open, but along one of the walls, they'll have a roof with walls, like a super miniature house built into the corner of the compound to where they sleep in, you know, whatever, make to hang out during the day, uh, mostly sleep in at night. But then in a lot of the compounds, they'll have another even tinier room in another corner of the compound where they dry out the poppy or the marijuana or these drugs that they're, that they're selling uh, or the Taliban's taking. So the day before we got injured, we had two roofs to be on. So that still left a little bit filled of vision that we, that just two people on a roof couldn't cover. Yep. But obviously two Marines in two different elevated corners of the compound is better than just one. So I was on the small roof above this, this uh, crop drying out room. And uh, I started getting shot at, surprise, surprise, about halfway through my four-hour shift. And it was a couple hours till the, till the uh, sun went down. And uh, it was way scarier than any other time before because it wasn't an AK, it wasn't an automatic weapon, it was a sniper. And up until that point, we had only ever seen... We saw, you know, a few IEDs, but mostly it was just long, hours long, intense firefights every day. But, you know, right down the road in Sangin, it was like an IED every two yeah. feet. So I'm up on this roof and I start getting shot at. And uh, I remember he would shoot and i could tell it was a single bolt action rifle obviously because it was a few seconds in between each shot and so thankfully during this shift on post i had been building the sandbag position and my buddies were throwing them up to me like while i was up there trying to stay vigilant and like on lookout but we still had to get it done so i was kind of doing two things at once i was stacking these sandbags thankfully by the time he started shooting at me I had got three high, so I had just enough to lay behind. So I'm, sit, I'm laying up against these sandbags after he starts shooting, and he would shoot, and I could feel the round, the thud in the sandbag that my back and body armor was laying up against. I'm just, no, please don't. You know? and, so, uh, and so, but in between every shot, you know, like my buddies, they kept throwing them up and I would reach over still behind the sandbags, pull one over to me. And right when he shot, I would stack it as quickly and efficiently, which probably wasn't very, uh, but as possible. And so I am getting towards the end of my shift. He probably shot at me for 15, 20 minutes, getting towards the end of my shift and my staff sergeant who had, I mean, combat was nothing new to him he had been in Ramadi back when it was a city of darkness uh this was his I th I believe 10th combat deployment so he knew the drill and again the sun was getting close to going down so he comes over and you know of course he's joking with me like hey carpenter like how's the sun tanning going all this stuff I'm getting shot at so I'm like <laughs> thanks Seth Sergeant like thanks for the love I'm like it's going pretty good he's like hey Come on down, and uh, we'll f finish building this once we get, you know, the cover of darkness. So, 
guy shoots. I grab my saw and I just jump off the roof, just take off. 15, 20 seconds later, a rocket comes in, vaporizes that whole post, every sandbag. We might have had one or two usable sandbags after. Damn. It hit the lip of the roof, destroyed the sandbags, but it messed up the integrity of that structure so much that later that night it collapsed. So we were down on sandbags. And we were down to one roof only. So me, that's why me and Nick were up there as a pair together. And because we were long sandbags, we were lying on our back, just like above the sandbags in front of us, just enough to scan yep. and be able to see the village. And so I asked him that about the grenade. He says, my ass is off this roof. I said, I'm right behind you. The next thing I know, I'm extremely disoriented. I felt like I had got hit really hard in the face by something. My vision was like looking at a TV with no connection, just white and gray static. And my ears were ringing extremely loud. And so I thought, okay, I first tried uh, hilariously to kind of push myself up and shake it off. And then I realized I couldn't feel my arms from the shoulders down, either one. And probably if I had more blood in me or I hadn't got hit so hard, I probably would have panicked more. But that just made me really start trying to dig deep inside my brain and think, okay, what could have possibly happened to me? The last thing I remember, uh, I'm pretty sure I was in Afghanistan. The last thing I can remember, I was on a roof. But, you know, what could have injured me this bad on a roof? Maybe I got off of the roof, went on a patrol, stepped on an IED, and the roof is just the last thing I can remember. Uh, but either way, the disoriented pieces kept swirling around. This next part will allude to Marine's humor. And I'm sitting there, like, just grasping for anything to help give me some context as to what I'm going through. And I'm like, man so messed up these guys are are pouring warm water all over me when i'm in this banged up state of course you know people are probably like warm water but again i was very disoriented and as i struggle with this warm water sensation i realized that my buddies were not messing with me and that that warm water feeling was blood and that i was profusely bleeding out and so with the casualties i had seen so far on that deployment with the uh, you know, somewhat of, of medical training that we get before we deploy yeah. and just physically how I felt, I knew that unfortunately my time was limited. And so I thought about uh, my family, uh, specifically my mom and how devastated she was going to be when I did not m survive to make it home. And I said a quick prayer for forgiveness and anything I had done wrong in my life. And I faded from consciousness in the world for what I thought was the last time on that roof. And I woke up almost five weeks later uh, to the first sight being Christmas stockings that my mom had hung on my hospital room wall at Walter Reed, which at the time was Bethesda National Naval Medical Center. But they merged hospitals in, I believe, 2014. But, you know, Walter Reed. So uh, five weeks, five weeks. Yeah. Did and they induce that? Did they keep you out for that long, or is that just how long it took you? I think it was a healthy mix of uh, <laughs> just getting hit really hard, but also that kind of transitioned into them keeping me induced so they could keep putting me through surgeries because I had to do a major surgery every other day, and then every day I did what's called a washout, and it's just what it says. It's a washout of all your wounds to prevent infection. Fuck. And that really was the start of, um, you know, the the journey of self-discovery, rediscovery, and um, uh, just the journey that I've, I've been on these past almost 11 years now. I can only imagine. I mean, so you, uh, for right, rightful reasons, have a gap in your memory. I'm assuming you've talked to other people that were there that day that filled in those gaps. Mm -hmm. What what happened in those moments that you can't remember? 
Well, along with those, uh, the guys that I was with, uh, who, um, came to be eyewitnesses and eyewitness testimony for the Pentagon and Department of Defense and Marine Corps. Um, I, uh, I covered the grenade for my fellow Marine that was thrown at us. When, and this, maybe this is a bizarre question, but you had plates on, right? Yes. Did you, where was the grenade on your body when it went off? Because I, I had always and have always wondered whether or not plates would actually do a substantial job of protecting you against even a contact with a grenade. Yeah, absolutely. The only reason, you know, um, that I'm sitting here today, as far as like my gear is concerned, yeah. uh, they were completely, I mean, I would beyond shattered, uh, probably shredded. Yeah. Uh, my tourniquet was melted to, uh, my plate carrier um, so the grenade was probably contacting your plate when it went off. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, upper right quadrant, I believe, okay. of my chest. Uh, and that's probably why my right arm uh, got so much damage as well. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, just incredible piece of gear, incredible technology. And um, an interesting fact about the plate carrier and the body armor is... Uh, and I have a picture in my book, but you can still go to Google Earth and find the compound that I was I was in and the roof that I was on. And one of uh, the definitive uh, strongest pieces of evidence in my 252 page investigation that took years to do and to my actions that day uh, when they brought the post blast analysis team to look at the roof, to look at my body armor, to um, you know take into account also my injuries that were being relayed to them, uh, my body armor with my weight behind it, in the simplest terms, was stronger and more dense than the roof itself yep so with physics blast and lazy people we take the path of least resistance and so when that grenade went off it blew down through the roof and blew a hole in the roof instead of i mean it, it did blow up obviously but yeah. instead of all the force going up it went down through the roof and actually blew down it didn't hurt him but it blew debris down on my navy corpsman who was sitting in that room that i told you about um that that the family sleeps in and so that was uh, uh, a very strong piece of evidence as to what exactly happened because uh nick couldn't testify because he was injured you know anything that happens as far as an award or uh, anything for valor and combat, uh, the any of the eyewitnesses can't have been exposed to the blast or can't have been injured because that could affect their, affect their recollection, yes. So I know almost nothing about the actual uh, procedure to even nominate somebody, let alone... Yeah, me either. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You said 252-page investigation? Yep. Just over two years, too. Now, is that... Is that normal? Is that just what they do because of the, not the severity of the award, but the, the, uh, the level of the award? Just, yeah, just the, uh, the requirements just to be confident in their decision. And obviously they probably don't want to award it and then realize later that oh, they course. could have yeah. done a more thorough job and they got to take it away. But, uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, it's still crazy and it's uh equally um as as uh kind of like a, a dark hole to me as it is you because i was at walter reed uh after i woke up i was at walter reed and recovered for about three years and so 2011 sometime i was still like extremely banged up i was outside I was out in downtown Bethesda at a Mexican restaurant with a couple of buddies and uh, I get a call and it's a chief warrant officer five Reeves and uh, you know I stepped out went to go talk to him and uh, he told me that uh, he was 
and I forget where he came from in the Marine Corps, but the Marine Corps assigned him temporarily and as long as it would take to my unit to spearhead the investigation. I don't like the term investigation. Yeah. Every time it's happened to me, it's not been for good things. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh, We need to think of a different term for that. Yeah. I mean, it's what they're doing, but damn it, we can think of something more positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Am the I in after, trouble here? I'm going to call it the good? after action. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Yeah. I have a little bit of uh, post-traumatic stress with the term investigation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't worry, Andy. You're out. You're out, man. You're out. <laughs> I don't know the statute of limitations on things, though. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so I just thought that was wild that they took a chief warrant officer five, probably towards the end of his career yeah. to, to spearhead this. So, um, you know, he asked me just straight up what I remembered. And I told him, you know, I apologize. And I said, I'm not really anything. And I do remember almost like muscle memory, almost as if, I didn't have a brain in my head and I just had an empty shell of a body. I do remember being on my knees and falling forward. And I, from just, you know, knowing space and situational awareness, I felt like I was a few inches off the ground. You know, if I would have just fallen forward on my knees and smacked the ground with my face, I felt like I was two or three inches before I hit the ground when something hit me really hard in the face. Mm -hmm. But obviously, like, I didn't know. That might have been completely made up. I couldn't remember anything. I didn't see the grenade. I don't remember hearing it, thinking about it, nothing. I didn't even know how I was injured until uh, after I woke up. I mean, it's a big explosive blast very close to your head, so yeah. none of that surprises me at all. Yeah, and see, it, it used to kind of get to me and bother me, but now yeah. I'm just... Uh, I, I reshaped my thinking and I'm just so thankful that uh, I did wake up and that those weren't my final moments that, yeah, I mean, it's understandable. Like, um, you get hit in the head, sometimes you can't remember stuff. So, yeah. uh, but I told him, you know, respectfully, I don't really remember anything. And uh, he thanked me and told me that no matter what happens with this investigation or what uh, is uncovered, that him and the Marines of 2-9 were proud of me. And uh, that was it. We hung up. And what year was this again? 11? Uh, I believe like mid to late 2011. Okay. And so we hung up. I told my buddies. They thought it was crazy, awesome. We were kind of had a kind of had a moment but was he the one who notified you of what the investigation was for because i'm assuming you were already nominated for the medal of honor at that point no 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 this was i mean i the whole year before that from when i got injured to walter reed up until that phone call um i did not know or assume anything i just thought i was i mean i was just a wounded warrior recovering trying to get on with life okay and and uh, early in 2011, when I was still in the hospital, it was a few weeks before I was going to get discharged and be able to go home for a little bit. But I did have a buddy that uh, was with me in Afghanistan that called and he said, hey, man, like me, all the guys, we know what you did. Some of the guys saw it. Uh, you know, we're going to, he might have said Mel of Honor, we're going to put you up for something. But as you know... I mean, at least in the Marine Corps, you got to come back from a firefight. You know, I got shot at this time and date. Mm -hmm. uh, I shot back. And you got to do all this just to say and get a combat action ribbon, much less, you know, uh, an award for valor. I yeah. mean, I just, I, especially being a, a young Lance Corporal, like, I just, to be honest, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. So I heard it. I thanked him. We hung up the phone. Never thought about it again. So that chief warrant, though, was the first time you officially got notified? Officially, okay. yes. And so we hung up, and I did not hear anything until um, November of 2013. It's two and a half years. Yes. And so I was at, I went to the Marine Corps Commandant's uh, birthday ball in D.C., and I had this, at the time, she was a captain, I believe, Captain Kendra Motes, 
public relations officer. And, you know, she called and said, hey, I know your mom, you and your mom are going to the ball. Would you be uh, willing to have coffee the next morning before you head out of town or go back to Walter Reed um, and talk about things? And so she kind of alluded to, hey, we don't know where it's at, your investigation. We don't know who signed off on it, but we do know it's still out there and going somewhere might just be sitting on a desk but it hasn't got it hasn't been denied yet and so even then i was like okay cool you know nothing's gonna happen from it and i had got out of the hospital i was uh a freshman at university of south carolina i had recovered done my three years in the hospital and did i would they medically retire you at the end of that or i did i chose okay. to medically retire the okay. marine the marine corps is awesome if you want to stay in to your limited capacity. They'll work around your limitations. They'll work around you, yes, which is amazing because it hasn't always been that way. So I'm very thankful that they give you that option. So but, you were a civilian, though. Yeah. You were out going to school. Okay, yeah. moved on. Yep. Yeah. And so I thought about it long and hard, decided to quote-unquote hang uniform up because two things. You know, I knew that I was always going to be, after being injured like I was, I knew I was always going to be connected to the Marine Corps and specifically those uh wounded warriors that I recovered with but uh, uh, the biggest reason that I was able to medically or that I was able to retire and and have that peace is I felt like I had accomplished what I set out to do at the very beginning I told you I wanted something that pushed me that would push me uh, up a purpose bigger than myself or any one individual. And so all these reasons I wanted to join after I, you know, gave my blood, sweat and tears for the Marine Corps in the country. You know, I felt like in a way I had done my part. So I chose to medically retire two weeks after spending three years in the hospital. I was walking to freshman classes as the old guy on campus, <laughs> you know, with, with my crutch, just moving along. But, uh, no, uh, I started s- school. I met with uh, Kendra that November uh, during after the ball. And uh, early in 2014, like early January, the calls and the check-ins and, hey, where are you at in life? What's going on? How's school? Are you still in school? Those are weird calls. That started to pick up. Yeah, especially <laughs> when it's people from the Pentagon. Yeah, like just, hey, Kyle, you know, what are you thinking about? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Like, why are you calling me? Yeah, like, <laughs> go call someone else. Uh, and so, but, you know, it started to get more serious, but I never thought it was ever really going to lead to anything. And so, uh, you know, sometime in January, it, we, we, I was a couple weeks into that semester, the spring semester, and they knew that school was my priority now, that I wanted to do well at it, and that, honestly, that school, no matter what happened, was going to be more important in the long run and in my life uh, than anything that was coming down the pipeline. So they encouraged, and this is the crazy part, they encouraged me to withdraw from classes because they said, hey, if this happens, first of all, you got to do another workup, but in a completely different way. You got to do all this prep stuff, everything from, you know, uh, on the on the later end, get your uniforms ready. But, you know, we have to get you ready for interviews. We have to do all this stuff. And it wasn't even guaranteed that I was going to get it. So I'm supposed to withdraw from classes. Yeah. Go uh, to the Pentagon, get all this training, so on and so forth, and it. I might get a call and say, "Oh, you know, sorry, it's not going to happen." Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't take that deal. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I had to think long and hard. I thought, okay, if it doesn't work, you know, I lost this semester, but obviously, I'm still. Yeah, I guess that's true. You could pick right back up. And yeah, continue on. Yeah, and so uh, over the next couple weeks. You know, I withdrew from class. Uh, I didn't withdraw from classes because I was waiting on, uh, you know, we heard, well, it might be, I might be at the Secretary of Defense. You know, it's out of the Marine Corps' hands now. All these like things. And I'm like, 
does anyone know for sure what's going on or where this is at? Like somebody probably threw it in the trash a year ago. Like what's going on? And so, uh, but you know, very quickly over January, it got serious. And so I did eventually get the heads up that the president would be calling me. And uh, I had waited to withdraw from classes because I was really trying to push it. I was thinking, okay, if the call's maybe going to come in February, you know, like I can stay in classes past the, hey, you can withdraw and there's no penalty. And I'm hoping if I tell the school why I withdrew after the deadline, like, <laughs> hey, the president's calling me, maybe they'll work with me and not give me all Fs in those classes. And so... Uh, so I got the word that he was going to call. How do you get that word? They, they, uh, I think it was Kendra or a, a Marine from the Pentagon calls and says, um, hey, the president is going to be calling you next Tuesday at exactly 1.36 p.m. One thirty six. I love it. I'm like, well, you know, I'm I'm busy then. Tell him to call at one thirty. Like, <laughs> I have my personal reflection time from one thirty to yeah. one forty five. Yeah. I'm not available. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my mom's cooking me lunch. Can you call another time? But uh, no. So I got that word, and uh, you know, I wanted to wait until I got on the phone before I withdrew from my classes. I mean, that's a pretty pretty solid notification though i would say yeah probably not going to call you to say yeah. hey man we're, we're passing on this yeah but the crazy thing is you know i still probably because it was just so such just a crazy surreal idea i i still didn't uh, really take it completely serious but um you know they they didn't cancel the call it got closer to tuesday so i was in class I left class, drove 30 minutes home. We checked my two brothers out of school. They were in uh, high school at the time. And uh, I hope I didn't disappoint because one of them thought, and it was a surprise while we were checking them out, one of them thought that we got a new dog. <laughs> and the other one thought that dad got a new recliner. So uh, there's a priority. Surprise, suckers. Yeah, there's a priorities in our family. But uh, we, I wanted to be with my family in that special moment. We checked them out. We were all sitting in the living room. The call came. Please tell me you sent it to voicemail. <laughs> that was your chance. Yeah. Call me back again. Beep, straight to voicemail. <laughs> uh, actually, even worse. Because I got home, and the first question I asked was, Hey, uh, does anyone have a phone charger? I'm on 7%. Oh, God. My mom's like, are you serious? Are you serious? The president's about to call and your phone's about to die? So I got a charger. I got charged up. Call came through. Um, you know, uh, casually talked with the president for five, 10 minutes. He said he looked forward to seeing me. He told me that based upon the recommendation from the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Defense, uh, he uh, was going to be awarding me the Medal of Honor. Um, my mom cried. Uh, my dad told me he was proud of me. I Your brother's like, where's the dog? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, we still got this old shitty recliner. Uh, but I don't know what I was doing or what I was thinking. I got done with that call, went back to Columbia, finished my day of classes, withdrew, school forgave me. Um, and... Uh, but it was crazy because from that moment, I mean, that was February. Mm -hmm. The semester doesn't end until, what, end of May or something. So, uh, and, and my ceremony was in June. And so I couldn't tell anyone. Really? Yeah. Why couldn't you tell anybody? I don't know. I don't know. I, I still haven't figured that out. But I couldn't tell anyone. Uh, so... During the weekends, I was hanging out with my friends. I was a normal college student. But during the week, when everyone thought I was in class, I was in the Pentagon getting grilled for hours on end on how to respond to abrasive questions or how to direct, you know, just preparing for the media kind of onslaught that yeah. was to come. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of felt bad, but it was also super strange, you know, <laughs> Having to be like, oh yeah, exams are they're, they're tough, man. My, <laughs> my classes are really wearing on me when I hadn't been in classes for two months. Yeah. And so, uh, but you know, my ceremony came, and um, 
it was incredible. It was chaotic. It was um, indescribable. Uh, but those two weeks were so hectic because the first week is your ceremony week. You're doing all this. I have no idea what you do during this time period. So what, what do you do during the ceremony week? So the ceremony week is all in D.C. You're, it's, you obviously have your ceremony three or four days after you get into town. But uh, I did like 12 hours straight of Capitol Hill office calls where I just went around to Congress uh, elected officials, either um, congressmen and women or senators, and just met them, hung out. Uh, it was cool. I just, I don't really know what the point of it was for, but, um, uh, 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 and then, uh, I, you know, the, uh, Marine barracks at eighth and I, the silent drill platoon, uh, and the Marine Corps band who are both just beyond words incredible. They give you a ceremony, you have your actual ceremony, and then you have to have a ceremony at the Pentagon where you're inducted into the hall of heroes. And, um, just all just crazy, just surreal stuff. And then you have your ceremony. And then the next week, uh, is your media tour. And that's throwing the first pitch out at the Padres game, David Letterman, all of these things. And, uh, every single day through ceremony week, well, the entire two weeks was like zero four, zero five, wake up. You go extremely hard all day long. I mean, just, uh, just way beyond anything that could be physically taxing. Just always worrying about, okay, what am I going to say? Is my uniform right? How am I going to represent myself? All of these, what question is going to come next in this interview? And then, so I got done at about midnight every night. Then I had this team that briefed me on the day that just happened. I'm like, can we skip over this? Like, I just lived I through it. There. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> the day that just happened, the day that was coming up the next day, and then I had to get whatever uniform or whatever I was wearing the next day ready. So it's like 2 a.m. I got to wake up in three hours and I'm lint rolling, you know, my uniform so like a fumes. zombie. Yeah. And so, uh, but it, incredible all around, but <clears throat> it was just so crazy and, you know, I got done with that. I went back to school. Uh, I was already public speaking and doing outreach and all of these things, but it just took it to an entirely next level. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I got injured. I went nonstop recovering three years, started college, got the medal, went nonstop for four years of college. And so uh, with that said, I was just so out of my mind crazy uh almost just constantly r ran myself into the ground that i never had time to truly think about and reflect on um what that moment meant to me and to the marine corps and the rest of the world yeah uh but getting back to uh, uh, the very beginning of our conversation about, you know, a lot of times you're defined as a Navy SEAL. I'm defined as a Medal of Honor recipient, a Marine, whatever, uh, which again, I'm working to, to not get away towards, but, but be seen equally as other things, you know, a traveler, an author, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, when the president draped the Medal of Honor around my neck, it was too heavy and surreal to to work through in that moment but now i realize that first of all the medal of honor is not mine it's never been an individual award it never will be but the medal represents my journey and and the family or the the journey that my family endured with me but you go beyond that it it represents all of the marines that were there boots on the ground with me those that um, you know, never made it home. It represents the entire Marine Corps, the military, our country. You know, I, I would like to think and I believe that it represents, or it, at least when people see it, it stands for 
you know, a, a beacon of hope for those around the world. Um, but it also represents all of those in Afghanistan, all of those kids that from the time they could walk, worked hard labor, much of the times forced hard labor in fields in 115 degree temperatures with no shoes on their feet. You know, they are, they are born, they grow up, they live and they die in that same oppressed environment. And just ultimately people that wake up every day and hope that today's sunrise is going to be a little bit better than yesterday's. And then beyond that, it represents all of the generations that came before us that not only never made it home, but that are still being guarded, laid to rest at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers. We can't tell their families how they gave that last full measure of devotion, how they gave that final breath in a field that most people don't even know where the country is on the map, can't pronounce the, the town that they were in when they, when they died. And so it's, uh, it, it, uh, I'm just so forever grateful, honored, and humbled that I got recognized by my country but at the same time, it's extremely heavy. And uh, that's how I describe it as a beautiful burden. To be honest, I can't even imagine the weight of what it feels like. Um, I've, I've had this conversation with Dakota and he described it, like I said, the same way. It's, uh, I mean, whether or not you want it to change your life, it, it's going to from an outside perspective. You know, whether or not you want people to remember you for that, they always will to a degree. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, it's an amazing thing, man. It, I wish, I wish that more stories like yours were told, you know, I wish more, well, one, I wish more recipients of the medal of honor were alive right. so they could tell, they could tell it in their own words. They could talk about the impact of their family and, and explain what it means to them because it's such, I don't know, to me, it's such a rarefied thing with a value that I have, not the, not the ribbon and the piece of metal itself what it stands for to me is so valuable and a lot of the ways that you just described i just i hope that those stories have the chance to be told because i think people hearing it it it's inspirational i mean dude it inspires me just sitting here listening to you talk about that i mean it's that's insane man that's beyond anything that i experienced when i was in the military for 17 years yeah well thank you but also um you know, I am out here telling it because I know that, uh, well, first off, there are so many that didn't make it home. But those that did, I know that every veteran can't or isn't comfortable, at least yet, or where they're at, to share these stories, to go back and relive them so they can educate people. And that's okay. But that um that means that us veterans that can you know have uh a beautiful obligation to and you know through school we were joking about you won the purple heart or i'm a medal of honor winner Congrats. yeah like damn oh, it awesome first place <laughs> uh you know in school all the time um other students and I had an incredible experience at USC I loved it um did it change for you post uh receiving the award you know there were pictures there were people recognizing me but ultimately it was really cool because I think that at the end of the day the kids students that were there knew that yes I was a veteran yes I am a Medal of Honor recipient but at the same time, I'm just trying to pass those exams like everyone else. I'm just trying to earn my degree and figure out life like all of them. And so it was always very uh, respectful and very cool. But so many, you know, when they approach me, and I understand that you see a guy that is all scarred up from combat, you know, he has a Medal of Honor or whatever. Uh, intimidating might not be the right word, but if if... Uh, you don't know about the military or about veterans. It, I'm sure, can be a little uneasy. Like, what do you say? 
sometimes you just don't know what to say and you don't want to be wrong but they would come up and say oh you're the guy that that won the purple heart and i'm thinking okay first off your show are telling me that <laughs> you don't really get it but also since it is after my Medal of Honor ceremony, and that's probably how you've seen me around, you don't know the difference between the Purple Heart and the Medal of Honor. And so I'm very thankful that I, I came to this kind of realization. I had this insight early on, and that was, besides taking a deep breath, you know, realizing that, okay, this is not a moment to get frustrated it's a educational opportunity. Yeah, their intentions are not malicious. Exactly, exactly. And so I'm just going to get upset or get bent out of shape and say something that I'll probably regret later on or get frustrated or short or whatever, therefore not solving the problem and therefore probably allowing or uh, not preventing that from happening to an another veteran or service member later on. And so uh, every time that happened, I just took the opportunity to tell them about the military or the Purple Heart or the Medal of Honor and, um, you know, feeling like we were both better when we came out of that. Um, it's a teachable moment for sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, like I told you before we started, uh, when you were on Rogan, you said, I've done more than some and less than others. And that's so true and that stuck with me and uh that just kind of helps that story because you know whatever it is whether it's a veteran you know, whether it's uh elected officials whatever it is um you can't expect and you know, we're all different and that's a beautiful thing and we all come from different places and backgrounds you can't expect everyone to know about the military. You can't expect everyone to know about how to set up a camera and, and get the sound and audio right. And, you know, we all have our own thing. So, you know, don't fault people for not knowing as much as you or, you know, uh, oh, you only went on one combat deployment. I went on five. Like, no, do you raise your right hand. I raise my, my right hand. And another thing, like, it really gets to me when veterans, when they approach me to talk, whatever, uh, they immediately have to tell me something that, like, validates or discredits kind of uh, their resume, I guess. <laughs> and if they're not veterans, you know, civilians always say, oh, well, you know, I, I was going to join the military or I almost did or whatever. And with them, I'm like, it's okay. You know, we felt called to do it. We did it. And you're making a difference in, in your life and, and your job and where you're at. Like, that was your path. That's okay. But with veterans, you know, it's always, well, nah, you know, I, I, I never went to combat or I never did anything like you or I didn't get hurt like you. And first I'm like, well, that's great. Awesome. Because it yeah. sucked being in the hospital for three years. But also, you know, I'll say, what was your job? Well, I was I was logistics. OK, so you played an integral part yep. in the logistics that helped me get the medical supplies that helped save my life and eventually led to us sitting here talking. You purified the water that we drank that allowed us to, to continue on with the mission. And so, you know, where you come from, what you've done, but also struggle is the main thing we should never compare. You know, people handle things they heal differently in their own time in their own ways and i tell people like when i speak and stuff if it takes you a day a month a year or the rest of your life to to heal to reach light at the end of that tunnel uh that's okay you know just as long as you 
And you don't even have to keep moving forward all the time. But as long as you always just try to take that small step forward, um, you know, uh, you can, uh, you can get through it. And, um, and, you know, we all play our part and, and, um, you know, we all contribute in our own ways. I get it often with, uh, vets who they open with almost exactly what you were saying. I, I was in the military, but I didn't do anything like you. <clears throat> and, I try as hard as I can to make sure everybody understands at least my philosophy on service. Like I have nothing but respect for anybody who served. Right. And, and also for the people who would say, you know, oh, I was going to join my response to them or people who email me now later in life and they'll talk about regret or they want to know my thoughts on going into the military at the very tail end of the age restriction. It's like, listen. For those of you outside of the military, there's more than one way to serve than just wearing a uniform. Exactly. Your family, your local community, state, you know, stake, fill in, fill in the blank. There's opportunities everywhere to make the world better. And the military people, you know, the SEAL name has been in the spotlight for quite some time now. And I think it's a double-edged sword. It's getting more people to pay attention, so maybe more people will want to do it. But I would say there's a chance that some of the people who now want to do it are there for the wrong reasons. The time will only tell and it can net that out. But I'm not able to do my job unless the entire wheel with all of the spokes is spinning. Right. The supply people. You know, I am not exactly certain how helicopters fly, but I'm pretty sure there's a team of people that keeps them together. And I need the pilots and the dude who fuels and the guy who drives the fuel truck and the water truck to spray down the gravel HLZ. Yep. And the like, it, we could go on and on and on and on. And if you look at it, for us to get a, a seal maneuver element on the ground of say, twelve people, that's hundreds of people that make that possible. Oh yeah. You pull those hundreds of people away, and they're not getting the detention, uh, uh, the detention, not in school, the attention that I think that they that they deserve, and hopefully would change how they felt about their station in comparison to others. You pull those people away, I can't do shit. I, you know. I can flap my arms as much as I want to. I can't fly to Target. Yeah. If, you know, it. it's, we're all in it together. It's unfortunate that some communities and aspects of those communities get more of a spotlight because it does create that my service wasn't as good as yours. It's like, stop right there, man. It, like, let's move on to something else. And also reframe how you think about your service. You, you're, like you said, we all rose we all you know, we raised our right hand and then to me that's all that matters yep exactly yeah. because when you raise your right hand you didn't know what the next day much less the next four years held oh for sure and we see every war every generation that there's always that that uh unexpected um part of the story that happens and the cook is sending rounds down range or, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Under Siege, but that cook's badass. Yeah, yeah. You've never seen it? Uh -uh. It's a documentary. Oh, it's I'll... not. It's a Steven Seagal movie where he plays a chef. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking got you so good. <laughs> First off, I hate Steven Seagal with a passion that I have a hard time describing, and I've never met the man, so I have no idea really why. But the idea of him burns me at like a granular level you're just in my jealous soul. of his karate skills listen that's possibly true he is a karate <laughs> master um or aikido whatever it is that he does but yeah we again we were out at that fob and i don't care what your nec is or your mos when mortar rounds start coming in hey man get your body arm in your helmet and do me a favor go point your gun in that direction exactly it was not like i'm sorry what 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 occupational school did you go to like, exactly no, there's none of that shit yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah what'd you major in international relations how'd you pick that so while i was going through or recovering at walter reed uh, again i was there for some time so after you know towards the tail end of my recovery when i was stable I could leave the hospital grounds. I was driving uh, almost back to just fully independent. I knew, especially when I started my medical board, which anyone listening not familiar with the medical board, it's a uh, long and painful 
process. I went you, through one as well. Yep. <laughs> so you uh, you go to a week or two worth of appointments, and they do everything from measure your scars, hearing tests, vision tests, and they compare all of that with all of those same tests that they did when you first came into the military. And as much as I hate the terminology, they compare those and then tell you how disabled you are. But for some reason, it takes six months to a year to get that disability percentage back. And also, they don't seem to do math that I was taught in school because it would be you're rated 50 percent for this and 30 percent for that and 40 percent for this. So your rating is 20 (laughs) percent. And I'm just like, can I? Can we write this out? Yeah. Like, I just want to understand the math that you're doing because this right. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My and number was at like two, three hundred, and they're like thirty. It's like what? What are we doing here? <laughs> A marine was probably God. it was probably in charge of that part of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, as I got more independent, I did my medical board. And I knew when I sent that off that I was going to have at least six months before I heard anything back. So instead of sitting around my barracks room uh, or on the campus of, or ba- campus, I'm getting school and a hospital mixed up on the base of Walter Reed, because like when you do your medical board, you don't have to. There's no more surgeries. There's no more therapy. I mean, yeah. you, you can go to therapy and just stay loose, stay sharp, whatever. But you are only able to start that medical board when your doctors say, okay, we've put Humpty Dumpty back together again as well as possible. We've done everything we can, at least for now. Bam, we give them permission to start the medical board. So uh, I, I, I didn't have anything to do. So again, instead of sitting around, I decided to fill my time. And I, there was always like Marine Corps generals, um, congressmen, senators, fill in the blank that would come and visit Walter Reed. And they would always say stuff, you know, hey, if you want to do an internship, if you want to come work for me, whatever, just give me a call. And uh, I took them up on it. And so the first internship I did, I used an organization at Walter Reed at the time. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still there. Uh, I think it was kind of fueled by the num- high number and amount of service members that were there at the time. But it was a nonprofit that helped expedite security clearances for guys if they wanted to do an internship within the intelligence agency. Interesting. Yeah, it was awesome. And so got that expedited. Uh, I did a three-month internship at the National Counterterrorism Center. I got my top secret, did that internship, and then uh, which was – beyond incredible i learned so much i had an amazing mentor and uh that really kind of uh i've always been interested in global affairs politics you know you name it i always feel like i have a pretty good idea of what's going on in the world so that just you know majorly added to it and that's what gave me the passion and 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 want to go uh, major in international relations But after that and before I got out of the hospital and went to school, I did a three-month internship on Capitol Hill as well, uh, where at the time I was kind of playing with the idea of maybe getting into politics. Good call. Yeah. But you didn't. Yeah, well, I learned quickly. Uh, (laughs) You know, here is the injured guy over here in the corner, and uh, I think I was like the only one making endless amounts of binders for congressional hearings. So all day long, I made binders. Uh, I ran, you know, like an errand boy all over Capitol Hill. And the the third thing that I did that took up most of my time was I answered the phone for angry constituents who believed that if they called and they were upset that the congressman that I worked for was going to drop everything was going to fly solve their personal problems get on the phone with them fly to personally see them and handle everything that they needed and so uh after many many angry phone calls and making binders until uh you know i I might have needed another surgery to to (laughs) fix my hands at walter reed uh and also seeing how much time and 
uh, effort and just how much goes into legislation that a lot of times never even comes to fruition. You know, okay, we just had this four hour hearing on this just random little piece of this legislation. Okay, you know, hearing adjourn. All right, we'll be back in two months to, you know, discuss the second half of this. I'm like, no, I can't do this. I got to. I mean, I don't have to see an immediate result with anything ever immediately, but I'm not talking about something and then working on a thousand other things and then two months later coming back to talk about the same thing that's probably still not going to go anywhere. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it, but still that taught me a lot. Um, it kind of got me since it was my second internship and the last thing I did before I got out and went to school you know, I, I uh, would wake up at five in the mornings. I would hit the gym on base and then I would have to block off like 45 minutes just to get my suit on because buttons are my biggest enemy now with my with my <laughs> with my hands and injuries. Yep. And so uh woke up at five, would go to the gym, eat breakfast, get my suit on and then I would go to my internship for the rest of the day. Uh, but that, you know, helped me kind of somewhat get in the mindset of getting out of the hospital and transitioning and and really becoming independent again critical question in the binders that you made did you draw any dicks in them no but i put some pop-up pictures so anyone <sighs> in the uh in the hearing would be able to to keep up with what's going on i feel like you're missing these critical opportunities you could have you could have been the dick bandit in congress and just drawn some nice veiny triumphant bastards in there and then also you could have iced the president one time like these two <laughs> key opportunities that i wanted you to take yeah but i couldn't be the dick bandit because i was the only one making binders all right i'm gonna need to put a little bit more thought in but that. i could have iced the president yeah. uh, <laughs> I, 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 i'm over two but really one for two okay fair enough <laughs> you were saying uh you know you woke up in the hospital five weeks of kind of just you know time in the ether and it was the beginning of a of a journey of reflection and growth what did, uh, what did it change or what did you find along that journey? That is a great question. And I discovered that, and a little bit of this in the Marine Corps before injured, but before I was injured, but your mind and body are far stronger and more resilient than you ever could imagine. I realized that perspective will get you through anything. And uh, I realized that um, in a way I taught myself and proved to myself that um the smallest of steps eventually completes the grandest of journeys. And that's the fa my favorite line from my whole book. And I say that because, and, and I use this example sometimes speaking to really show people, you know, what they can not only make it through after getting knocked down in life, but that they can truly come back better and stronger and you might be physically mentally or emotionally different and that is okay but after i woke up i was uh my arms were tied up because of swelling like i don't even know what this rig was but it was a big square metal thing above my bed and uh, my arms were tied up to it um you know, I woke up, my right eye had already, you know, stopped working, my eardrums were blown out, and I, I mean, I was going to the bathroom in a bedpan for weeks. Um, I had a trach for three months, which was like the worst thing ever, breathing through that straw, because like you're in all this pain, mm -hmm. you're trying not to panic. By the time you get just enough air to satisfy you in, you're already panicking to breathe it out because all of it's going just through that one way too. Um, but I say all that to say in that low knockdown uh, 
physical and mental state. I set at the time a very um, unrealistic goal. And I didn't really even set the goal. I just thought, hey, what is something I can do one day to show or prove to myself and this was not for anyone else i didn't even tell anyone this for years until i signed up for the marathon but i just thought internally like what is something i could accomplish that would make me realize that i'm not you know i'm still kyle one that's the main thing because i mean you wake up and your entire world and bodies change you know, you don't exactly know where to go from there or what to do now. So I wanted something that would prove to me and show me that I'm still Kyle. But I also wanted something that if I did it, I would know that I came back even better and stronger than before I got knocked down. And I thought, okay, well, I've never run a marathon. That was kind of something I'd always thought about wanting to do. And I thought, hey, if I can do it now, you know, I'm, I'm back. And so uh, through many slow, long, painful first few months, you know, I realized, okay, if I can sit up in the bed, because I, you know, when you're still unconscious, your body and everything in it is atrophying for five weeks almost, you know, you get, at least I did, extremely, extremely ill, nauseous, anytime you try to do anything. So at first I was like, okay, if I can sit up in the bed, I can work on hanging my feet off the edge of my bed. If I can hang my feet off the edge of my bed, I can work on standing. If I can stand, I can take a step. If I can take a step, I can walk. If I can walk, I can run. And maybe one day I can attempt to to run that marathon. And so now today I've crossed that finish line three times, but uh, the first time that I did it and I actually had a a pretty decent time and I didn't really train for it Um, but uh, the first time I I crossed that finish line uh, I'm thankful I had sunglasses on because I started tearing up and again not for anyone else or any other reason besides uh, I proved to myself that what I was trying to teach myself all along over those many years in the hospital was actually true. And that if you just, you know, take that small step forward, even when you don't want to, if you just, just try to stay positive and find the silver linings and things, focus on being a good person and doing good things and Again, you uh, you can not only get to the light at the end of that tunnel, but you know if you focus on the right things, you can do it with a smile on your face. And so uh, that has really just stuck with me. As I still can't believe I did it and, and ran those marathons, but that's just stuck with me. That um, you know you can get through anything, and anything can be adapted. And uh, again, you're stronger and more resilient than you really ever know until you have to be. Yeah, I agree. What, uh, you know, you set that goal for yourself a while ago. What goals do you have for yourself now that are beyond that? I want, with the time that I have, to make the biggest, most efficient impact on the world that I can and enjoy life and do crazy things while I, um, you know, work towards reaching that goal. And the thing is, I don't know what, I don't know exactly what that is. I was going to ask you, that was my next question. What kind of crazy are you interested in here? I might know some people. We can get you into some Uh, stuff. Oh, oh, I'm up for anything. It's just (laughs) that end goal of making the biggest impact. I don't know exactly what that impact is. Uh, but that's the beautiful thing about life and at least the journey that I've been on uh, and really starting out at the very beginning, a life of service. That really translates to a life of the unknown. You know, you don't know what PT holds the next morning. You don't know when or where that next deployment 
is, um, you don't know if you're going to survive those 20 years. And so, uh, you know, my life was drastically and, and forever altered the moment that grenade detonated. And because of that, so many unknowns followed. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why I just say, take that small step forward, stay positive, you know, do good things for yourself and people around you. And you don't have to know exactly where you're going all the time. You don't have to have a perfect plan. Uh, you just have to stay the path. And I believe most of the times in life, first of all, you can't really prepare for life completely. But I just think most of the times in life, if you stick to the fundamentals and a work ethic and positivity, uh, it'll take you far beyond what you could have planned and or what you could have expected. Yeah. I, I always try to tell people the, the number of things you can control in your life is essentially zero. Right. I mean, you can, can control yourself. So you have no control over what happens to you, but you always have complete control over how you receive it. Yep. Which is a tough, that's a tough one to get in your head sometimes because bad things happen to great people and, you know, everybody, not everybody, but those people, you know, they want to be frustrated or angry or have an emotional attachment or an outburst. And it's, those are a choice. You know, you can choose to refocus and refilter those things towards the positivity or looking at the silver lining. Um, you know, Jocko talks about it with, you know, his video, Good. Yeah. You know, some some of those are easy, like, got fired from my job, you know, okay, good. You got a chance to grow. And I've had topics or uh, conversations with him offline. He's like, yeah, the tough ones are, hey, my son just died of uh, leu leukemia and he's four. Yeah. That's a tough one to put good next to. Yeah. You know, but uh, there's growth that can come from it. It's one thing I'd like to see a little bit more of a focus on in the veteran community is opposed to always talking about post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic growth. Right. I, you can work through it. And I, and I say that as being somebody, I have a post-traumatic stress rating. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever exhibited a single symptom that you would like see on TV, like that stuff when in entertainment. Right. I don't recognize any of that. Um, but I think about stuff from my previous occupation every day. There's things that I wish I could change. There's wish things that I wish I would have done differently. But I also think that I am a better person by addressing those things and working through them. Absolutely. It's recoverable. I can't say I hate the term always and never, but I think in most instances it's recoverable unless you define yourself by that rating or yep. the pin on your chest or exactly. an award that you get. Then I think you're in the seventh layer of hell, and I don't know if it's escapable. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, but also it's important, uh, just as important as growing to never forget the times that you saw that glass half empty instead of half full. Oh yeah. There's lessons there. <laughs> yeah. Because that, you know, that perspective always yes. keeps future victories and future failures in check. And so, uh, yeah, don't just grow and move on and forget, you know, always keep those failures with you. Uh, cause they've been my best teachers throughout the course of my life. Yeah. And you, and we wouldn't be where we are. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, obvious, but, uh, you know, thankfully, I, I don't know, probably because it was just so daunting to think about being in the hospital for three years. But early on, you know, I'm so thankful that I just decided, okay, you know, the more I focus on what happened, what could have been, the what ifs, the more maybe not detrimental but the more hindering it will be for my recovery from here on out. And I, it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. But, you know, uh, whether you're a veteran going through something, a civilian going through something, um, you have to realize that, uh, and again, this is obvious and everyone knows this, but there's nothing you can do to change, to take back, to alter one second of the past. I mean, the words we said in this podcast, they are what they are. They're there. You know, if we did good, great. 
if we didn't improve, you know, whatever. Can't take it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you just, uh, you know, you can only um, move forward. You can only move forward. So you might as well look forward while keeping the past in mind, learning from it, and just try to, you know, uh, strive to just become the best version of yourself at, you know, every, uh, every, uh, every day or every, you know, point in your life that you kind of sit down and think about things. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Does the, does the medal of honor come with an obligation for you to attend events? Nothing. Okay. Cause I'm, I'm just curious. Um, there, there's now Ed Byers is a living, uh, Ed's a man. Ed's the man. Yeah. And then there was uh, a couple guys from Vietnam and it, uh, again, I know very little about the actual mechanism to get the award and what happens afterwards. I know there's a Medal of Honor, uh, what is it, uh, Society? Yeah, Medal okay. of Honor Society. And I know mm -hmm. they do meetings, uh, or not gatherings, but sometimes you will see people out and about wearing the medal. And it, I was just curious if that's a choice that they make to go there or if it comes with an obligation to represent the military or armed forces places. Yeah, so the Medal of Honor Society is... Uh, all living recipients with a headquarters administration element. And um, we have a character development program, which is really awesome. We're uh, more of the uh, older generation are heavily into the schools and doing all that, mm -hmm. which I love going to schools. I'll always do that. But, you know, right now trying to just figure things out, they've had – a long time to figure it out and and figure out being a recipient what they want to give their time and effort to and so uh it's amazing um our character development program um but you know i'm kind of anyone uh anywhere anytime i can help do this learn about this you know work here whatever um but uh, to answer your question there is no mandatory things we have to do if you see a Medal of Honor recipient out there doing outreach um, or really any time wearing the medal, that is something that, and we do have a few events throughout the year. Mm -hmm. We have a Medal of Honor convention uh, in the fall of every year where we'll go out to schools, we'll go out to throughout the community, do events and things. Um, but the vast majority of the time, if you see a recipient out there, it's just on their own. And they do have a fund that say if you go on this trip just from the good of your heart for personal outreach out of your pocket we reimburse you um so but really it's just um it's just kind of like an unspoken thing that whatever you do just obviously keep in mind what the metal represents yeah it's very public obviously right yeah. right and so just uh be smart but uh if it's for if it's for good for education Tell, teaching about the military or just life lessons that that recipients have learned then um you know i mean uh i still get nervous and still feel like i'm a complete boot and uh when <laughs> when i walk into a room with those guys and i don't i don't think at least uh for a while that'll ever go away but um like uh herschel woody williams mm -hmm. oldest marine recipient I believe he's 92, but he charged Iwo Jima onto Iwo Jima with a flamethrower. How S bummed are you that we weren't able to use those? I was pissed. Uh, well, talking to him, they were pretty effective. So I know. So effective, they said, against the Geneva Convention. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, Just uh, once. Yeah. I did not want to charge Iwo Jima. Let me be very clear. Yeah. This. At all. <laughs> but I just wanted to carry a flamethrower one time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, Woody's a man. But uh, like Woody and uh, some of the other older recipients from the Army, um, man, they put me and the younger guys to shame. It is crazy. I mean, they will be on the road 270 days a year at 70, 80, 90 years old. And I mean, we'll be at an event. And, uh, you know, everyone wants to hang out after the event the night before. So we're going to bed at 12, 1, 2. We have to be up at 
in the lobby meeting at 6, 7 a.m. the next morning. You know, I'll be struggling to get down there, uh, you know, working on getting my medal on in the lobby. And they'll have been sitting there for an hour just chatting it up, having coffee, you know, like like they're 20 years old, just unlimited <laughs> energy. And, and they're giving me shit like, oh, yeah, nice of you to join us, Carpenter. Like, uh, it see, never ends. must be the Marine in you, you know, just yep. uh, but they're incredible. And I've learned a lot from all of the older recipients. And uh, I just hope that I can give back uh, as much as they did. What an amazing group to be a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. It's uh, it's humbling, man, to have you sitting here and to listen to you talk about your experience. I have uh, it's I'm blown away how often people who have been through things like you have been through have the most positive attitudes of people in our society that I can see that I experience at least. Whereas I see a lot of people who have encountered and been through far less of a, let alone the physical, but the mental and the rediscovery and the growth process and their attitude sucks. And they they got nothing but complaints and ho hum is me. And this, and I can't do what I want to do because fill in the blank is standing in the way. And I talk with people like you, it's like, yeah, this horrendous shit happened to me and I came out of it a better, more positive person. It's, it's very humbling to hear. And it honestly, it, like it recharges my batteries. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I think just on that point, uh, you know, like I said towards the beginning of this, I 100% thought those were my final moments on that roof. And so after I woke up, I've always been in complete awe that I did wake up. I mean, I had to be resuscitated multiple times over my journey. Uh, and just to think about the logistics again, that got me through three combat trauma hospitals, Germany, and then here, uh, to have even woke up is beyond incredible. And I can never really be down too much because of that. Cause I, I truly do feel like every day is uh, a bonus round. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess along with that, everything I do, you know, meeting you, sitting here in this podcast, being alive to receive the medal. I mean, every single day, uh, running out on the frozen lake. Uh, what was Foys. Yeah, Foys. <laughs> you know, like that was a bucket list item. Go out <laughs> and walk on a frozen lake. You know, southern southern boy over here. I thought that was crazy, and I was probably acting like a first grader with excitement. But but everything I do, every person I meet is, you know, I, I can't help but think, you know, wow, I almost never had that experience. And, you know, uh, beyond that, I just think going through extremely hard things, uh, whether it's m a moment that has long lasting effects or an entire lifetime of working hard labor in fields uh, or, um, you know, being... Uh, being born or incurring an injury that f permanently forever changes you and makes you adapt almost every situation, you know, that builds resiliency. And that those things force you to ha try to search for that perspective and those silver linings. And so, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I had the support system and the people around me that loved me and kind of helped me in those moments where I struggled. Uh, but, but just, uh, I appreciate it. That means a lot because it's been an active effort, you know, an, an active, and it's never going to end. That's the, that me, maybe that's the magic or the secret is that the struggle, it, maybe that's the essential part of life is that struggle. Because I find when I seek things that I struggle with, I grow. Yeah, and I and I want people to do exactly the same. I don't want people to be. Well, I want people to be in pain a little bit, if I'm being totally honest. But it's because there's that struggle and the growth that comes. Yeah, that comes from it. Of course. Yeah, oh. and also, so I want to throw one more uh, note in there. Um, just talking about whether you want to call it uh, post traumatic stress or being stuck and not being able to move forward as a veteran. 
um, I try to, cause I, I get questions surrounding this a lot. How do you get through it? What do you do? What support groups have you leaned on? But you just have to keep in mind that those that you lost, those that you're hurting for, those that are now a void in your life, that is probably heavily contributing to this mental and emotional struggle. Just keep in mind that they, first of all, felt called. They believed it was the purpose for their life. And they got up when they could have done anything else in the world and went into that recruiting station and raised their right hand. Just like all those that thankfully didn't get killed did as well. And so, yes, we should miss them. Yes, it's going to be hard to miss them. But at the same time, you are here. So live your life. Spread the good word. And educate people for those that can't anymore. You know, I, and I guess that's the search for the silver lining in, in every in every um, situation with me. But you know, it it is true. I mean, you can hurt for them, but be thankful you're alive and and use this opportunity uh, because besides their actions and their legacy. They don't have a voice anymore. And so unless it's their families, you know, you have that beautiful obligation. And I would think, at least for me, it's therapeutic. You know, it it hurts to think about Hughes, who we argued over which hot sauce was the best. At 19 years old, you know, a, a, a young kid from Louisiana stepped on an IED in the middle of the night, and, you know, we found fragments of him at 19 i mean you got to think why did that happen why so young you know why 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 but but if anything you know like Patton said you know be thankful you know thank god that such men lived and raised their right hand and and did that and it was their decision so use that as fuel and you know carrying on their name but and, and not just you know, quiet, you're dealing with it on your own, you know, you're making yourself feel like you were the only one on that deployment. You know, there's others, there's others suffering, there's others you can reach out to. And even if you don't want to be the whole, hey, I'm a veteran forever, even if you want to get away from it, you know, you can still, you can still spread the good word about them and their sacrifice. That could potentially be the best ending to a podcast ever right there. But before we go, how can people find you? Uh, well, going back to the Medal of Honor, this was uh, a topic of discussion. But uh, Instagram and Twitter uh, are, my, are my go-tos. At Chicks Dig Scars. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm actually, uh, thank you for letting uh, ben tag along oh, and course. record this because uh, I've been focusing a lot on my YouTube channel. And uh, I just realized with this time to rest my mind during quarantine that I didn't really even know I needed. Uh, I realized that I thought for so many years, okay, I'm going to become the best speaker I can, which translates and leads to me getting in front of as many people as possible. And the bigger the crowds, the more people can hear my message. But now I'm just seeing, along with social media, but to make a YouTube video, to post it, and immediately someone on the other side of the world can see it. And it's almost like, you know, I, I've told people through words and stories that they can get through things, that they can stay positive. But when you watch a video of me climbing a mountain or having a complete wipeout, wake surfing, you know, 
you know what I've been through. You know I got knocked down, but now I'm loving life. You can hear me breathing hard as I climb this mountain, and it's just immediate. It's like a, an immediate uh, assistant to my overall mission. I'm just I'm realizing that there's a lot more ways to impact the world. Um, it and, touches so and, many people and people too. than just speak. And, uh, you know, media interviews and stuff, which I'm pretty much done with. But well, it's an amplifier for your message. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not I think whew, my jury, I would say my jury is out on social media, but I think I really am leaning towards there's more negative uh. aspects than positive. But if you are a positive person, it's a natural extension of your message. So you can use right. it for good. But damn, man, I worry about social media and the, the dark side of that path. I know it's a, uh, mm, uh, I'm rarely at a loss for words, whether that's a good or bad thing, but, uh, I am too on that topic I, because I, and, and I say it watching my own kids and their consumption and reliance. I don't know. I don't have a solution for it either, but or I have, where we go from here. Correct. So I'm at a loss for words uh, as well on that one, but something I keep my eye on. Yeah. Closing words by Kyle Carpenter. Oh, you're going to put the pressure on me here. It doesn't have to be anything fantastic. You'd be like, I like strawberries. You can go with whatever you want. (laughs) I love strawberries. (laughs) Um, I would say, uh, thank you for your time and listening to my message and my journey. And, um, I just truly appreciate any, any of you out there listening. I truly appreciate, uh, your love and support. And if you're a veteran, I'm honored to have worn the same uniform as you. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you for your time, man. Thanks, man. Yep. Understand the west bank of the river? That's a farm, west bank, and give me hell. Still give it to me in the grove. Okay, once in from the north, I've got the west bank of the river. Who's going to give it to you in the grove? Roger, give me that gun run. Wait a long that fast, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com and there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab, and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you could tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, see you.